sh I can show you a, a place online where I can get Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, you'll have one though. What I'm saying is, is that they're a lure lock and they're usually going to be interchangeable, right? That's that's part of like some of these things. So the needles you're going to see for me actually come from a veterinary clinic. Uh -huh. That that you guys can't really get, and they're they're stainless steel, and they're autoclavable. So the needles so that. I was gonna ask us about contamination, so I can clean it. Well, you can clean it. Yeah, we'll get to that. Exactly. We're gonna get to that. We're gonna get to that part too. No, this is the RC the Curiosity Bruin, right? All the questions. This is what happens, right? We move from we move from I can't do it. I might be anxious to do it to like I'm curious. I want to do more of it, right? Kind of sounds like sex. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's all pretty universal, right? So, you are still in the chair. Well, that me this isn't chair. that type of presentation. You are present. You are present. We appreciate your presence. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you did. <laughs> uh, it'd be hard to tell that you appeared, you guys. <laughs> Whew. Okay. No, I'm getting there. I'm just getting back to my college land right now. So, um, <laughs> I think the mushrooms are kicking in. All right. So, all right. So, listen. So, this is a 16 gauge needle. These are pretty small ones. We're gonna show you another type of needle that's like yeah. five or six inches, like, mm -hmm. but we use those for liquid cultures. So these like big hypodermic needles. I love them. If you haven't seen those before and you're an experienced cultivator, yeah, right there. Uh, you can get them on Etsy. Just type in, you know, eight inch needle or something. You should be able to find it. It's funny thing to type in on Etsy, but you know. Uh, <laughs> not the worst thing I've talked about. Not the worst thing. Not the worst thing. Okay, good. Uh, we're in good, good company then. Um, so this tray. Tray, help the brother out. Tray, can you? What's the next step here? Tray's Trey's teacher in training. Oh, okay. Yeah. Trey's been doing all this work. So Trey, give a little background. Trey moved from Ohio to come live with me at my house and to cultivate while I kind of do my thing and we build this together. I, I really want you to see this. A lot of stuff even here has come from other cultivators that are in the other room. I mean, we help each other out. Like this is about community for me, you know, always. I feel like if I'm sitting here, nobody else can see it. What? You feel that way? Well, because, yeah, because I'm in front of it. Okay. We'll make sure they see. Okay. Yeah, we'll make sure they see. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Don't even worry about that. What, what did you just spray? Uh, I just so sprayed ice. Water. Water. Yeah, so walk, walk them through this part of it. All right, so um, I just take a clean paper towel and just spray ice oil on it, just like wipe on the injection port just to make sure it's clean. And then, do you use 70 or 90? 70. You know why? No, I don't. But I've seen online that people water people, water people water. say seventy's better, but I've been using ninety nine. Yes, yeah, and this person lives lives has worked in a lab and can give you the scientific understanding. What's what is it? Um, ninety nine just evaporates quicker. Yeah, so there's this action called lysine, right? It's L Y S E, lysine the cell wall. It's degrading the cell wall. So when you use anywhere from sixty to seventy percent out rubbing alcohol. That's the ideal concentration because what's happening is that is that all the bacteria and stuff is um, <sighs> just need more of this. Uh, all the bacteria and stuff is is happening and being suspended by the liquid, right, and the alcohol. But it needs to be there long enough so that the alcohol can interact with all the bacteria. It's not that 99% doesn't kill. It's just that the curve, if this is the curve that's going up towards all of them being killed and then levels out. It'll just kind of go like this. You know, it'll kill some of them, but then it stops working because all the alcohol evaporates faster than than needed. You know, so you also conserve resources that way. You know, you you get to take 99 percent or 100 percent. It'll usually be 99 percent. I think you can only get like 100 percent in things that are a little bit more stable, like methanol um, or something. So ethanol is usually lab standard here, right? If you can get access to ethanol, ethanol is actually even better for all of us. Like it's just a little bit more. You can basically drink it. I'm pretty sure. Um, okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so, unless it's too dangerous. Yeah, you don't want it too dangerous. You can use ethanol like like Everclear or 420 extractors. Yes. Well. Like 99, just pour out a little bit of water in it. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, exactly. So when we're talking about these things, we are always trying to move in the direction of like ensuring that we're using things that are better for ourselves, better for the environment, and having some like control over like the cascading effects of our actions. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're, you're gonna see us too. We brought some uh, compostable liners today for the tubs, you know, that we've been wow. starting to work with, right? And that's something that Shroom Tubs is gonna be holding here soon too, you know? And so, um, so yeah, this is the purpose, right? We start one place and we may be using these bags and then in the future I might give you like a silicone bag to use that's reusable, you know? And that's, the, that's also the thought process that we wanna be having as we're going through this experience today is that uh, there's a lot of innovation on the table for all of us. Um, so what's the next step here? So then you want to make sure the needle is clean, so I use a torch to flame sterilize it, so you mean actually like do the injection there? Yeah. Well, get it ready for her, and then, yeah, and then she can do it. Do you ever, do you put any yeah. ISO on the needle? Yeah. yeah. That's good. So even, you can do it, you only almost have to see it red. Like you can almost just like, five seconds across it, you're fine. The red is gonna start leaving some carbon buildup and stuff at some point, but it's totally fine. Um, we can also pass this around after, but yeah, so direct here on how to do this. Yeah, so I usually just wipe it out right before I put the needle in, and then. So right through, anywhere on there, or in the middle? Uh, yeah, just one I like that. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I, I usually do, I've been doing a lot just to like get things started, but you can probably just put in like uh, three cc's down. So. Okay, and just straight in, or do yeah. I like? Move yeah, just the straight in. Just straight in because. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It'll, it, like, it, it all depends, like, if, if the grain's more hydrated, then you don't want to use, like, a lot of liquid culture, so I, I would use less, but if it's dry, then I can use more, and then it would just come nice faster. Say that again. So, like, if you, if you use more liquid culture, um, and the, the grain's drier, and, like, the reason for the grain being dry, like, you don't want it, like, you, you already, like, have all the water in the grain, so you don't want to put like an extra, like a ton of extra water in, because then that can cause contamination and everything. So, so yeah, if it's if it's dry, then I'll I'll inject more liquid culture. If it's not, then I'll use less. And then the only difference is like it might just calm my slower depending on. What's your average ratio? Like what do you have like a like a usual amount you're like trying to put in there? Um, like, like three pound. The three pound bags, I've been putting just like the whole syringe in it. Really? Okay. And that's how many bags per tub? Sorry, about like getting ahead of ourselves. Good. All right. Um. Yeah, why don't we wait to get there? Okay. <laughs> yeah, why don't we wait to get there? It, it does imply a conversation just about like sure. right, all of that, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So thank you so much, Trey. Um, yeah, right here. So, so what do we just do there? Not Not inoculate, really the bag. inoculate the bag. What happens after that? The spores so start shrinking us on and colonize the bag. Yeah, so, so this is actually not spores. This is a liquid culture. What's the difference between a spore syringe and a liquid culture? That's got my selling in it. Yeah, what's spores. illegal? This. There's a lot of illegal things in here, actually. Hold on. I think it's what so oh. Everything has a sports range. Oh, no, I, I took it out last night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there is. You're walking in the mouth. Uh, what's the issue? Oh, yeah! Woo! Nice! This isn't mine. Uh, it's for our, our cultivators. It's sure. a whale. Do you know what a whale is? A whale. A whale. Uh, what strain was it that you guys just put in? Oh, uh, you want to? Yeah, what's the next step on there? What do we not do to that bag? Uh oh. What do we sometimes not do? <laughs> not label. Yeah, so uh, Man, do dude. we have a, a, anything, a labeling device? We do. Yes. <laughs> I've been thing. trying to get better at labeling too. It's like getting a mini Christmas. Like in three I'm like, weeks, man, I did this like, oh, yeah. recently. 
Yeah. <laughs> I was, it was like last week of the week. Couple days ago. Sticker sheets that just have like hundreds of like little tiny sticker. I was thinking about like using stickers to start like labeling and having like a low key. Yeah. Um, master a key because yeah, like every time, every time I write stuff with markers, it always seems to wipe off on everything. So like yeah. number. Yeah, yeah number, saying, number like, like key everything key. stuff yeah. like that. Colored but, masking tape like, looks great. Is it a color? It doesn't leave anything out there. There you, you go. liquid culture we're putting in there, we wrote the date, and then who knows how long it takes for like some of these things to usually colonize. Like to finish or to start showing signs? Kind of Both. Yeah. Three, weeks. Three weeks. How long? Three weeks. Three weeks to fully colonize, and then how, how soon will you maybe start seeing the initial signs? Two days. Two days. Just a, sometimes a very I've seen day. some stuff the next day, yeah. Like, yeah, it's doing? like, you know, with, <laughs> with, with liquid cultures and stuff like that, I've just noticed some variance around, like, uh, how quick it's going to start growing. I've even seen spores germinate pretty fast, you know what I mean? So I think it has, it has this is where we're at a place of, like, here, I'll see. It's like, uh... <laughs> honk for mushrooms. Yeah, honk for mushrooms. Um... Yeah, so, so with this, what we're looking at then is probably three weeks, roughly. Two to four weeks, I think, is the sort of standard. I've had bags fully colonized in a week, you know? And this is where you're going to start kind of developing that relationship with the mycelium that you're growing, you know? And having a, having a good understanding of, like, how fast it's growing, uh, how vigorous it is, and also riding its momentum. You know, because what you're wanting to do is really ride that forward energy for mycelium, ride that sort of like forward progression so that if the mycelium wants to grow, you're like, then okay, let's do the transfer from the plate within the first few days. It's growing really fast, that looks really nice, and then we're gonna do it into a liquid culture, and then we're gonna go from liquid culture into a bag. While we run down this, what are the seeds of the mushroom? Spores. Spores, right? So that's like getting like tomato seeds or something. You know? And so we want to have this working model. It's like, what What if I had spores? What would I do with spores? What if I just had a spore print? And you put it into water or something. You can. You can. You can scrape spores right onto agar. Right? You know? And so why is it sometimes wise not to put spores straight on the grain? Right? So you, you're, you're taking spores that are coming out of the, the, you know, out of the caps of these mushrooms, right? And they drop them. And so that is an inherently not a sterile, it's a living environment. So spores themselves are, and I'm just going to give you this, even the thing that you think is sterile is probably not. So just go in with the assumption that everything you're doing is still not clean. That's sort of like what you do in any lab environment. Like, yeah, like the hubris, right? Like it's like uh, humans... I want to move you away from an understanding of any aspect of control in this reality, and I want to work us towards mastery. That's what we're, we're, we're uh, and that's, mastery is understanding the dynamics of the environment that you're in and being able to go with it and like utilize that energy to, to keep going forward. Just like making sure the river keeps going forward. Some people just want to stop the river so that everyone looks at it, right? That's not what we're doing because the river's all going to go to the ocean. So I'm always going to be like, how do we keep the energy moving forward? That's it. You know what I mean? And so mushroom cultivation is sort of like that too. You're like, ah, oh, okay, like, and we'll get into some of these things like contamination and all that. But, uh, but yeah, so if you have spores, a good idea is maybe agar, 
first. Put it into a liquid solution if you want to, to like make it into a syringe. That's what you'll see like sometimes the, the things that you buy online are like the spore syringes. I'm not gonna show you how to do that here just because it's like a whole other process, but um, it's just taking the spores, putting it, keeping, having them where they're, wherever they're at, which is probably gonna be on tin foil, and then having sterile water to put them in, and you scrape them into it, and then you plunge it, you know, and you wanna make sure that that's completely mixed up, and then you make your own spore syringes. I don't make spore syringes, so like, it's, I guess I'm gonna show you the things that I do just because like, when you get into the cultivation practice, there's no reason to make a spore syringe for yourself. Because like, you'll just use the spores on new agar. It's an extra step. Mm -hmm. The spore syringe is like meeting the, the market demand. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's like, that's just like making it accessible because that's what's legal in most places. Ironically, California might be one of the first to pass like something related to like legalizing all psychedelics and they still don't actually even allow spores. Yeah. yeah. I think there's five other states. That checks out though. Uh, California. California, Georgia. Okay, California, Georgia, Idaho. Just, okay. California, Georgia, Idaho. Yeah. When, I, when I read that, it made me actually hopeful that like there's going to be like a mass legalization of it soon. And the reason why they excluded that aspect is because they want to somehow have control over almost like the legal marijuana market. California, of course. It's California. Money. Don't like, think I saw it as like a hopeful thing. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm always going to be like positive, I'm always gonna be yeah. about like, cause I don't get involved in drama, I don't get involved in that type of stuff, but also don't, tr like California is always gonna do it California's way. Like, so just know that and like, just know you're gonna have to deal with probably a bunch of other things, even if they do, you know? And so like, there's a really bright future here. All this does happen, all this does go legal, all this does like hit us like in all of our communities and we just have to be a part of the grassroots part. You know, I think the biggest part is just making sure that like you have access. So you don't, you're not like, uh, like put up against the wall by the state and all that stuff, you know? We want to power the people, mushrooms the people, <laughs> you know? So like, uh, so that's that. So spores, we can go in a syringe, we can put them on agar. And then what happens? How long does it usually take for like spores to germinate on agar? Yeah, at least sometime during that week, you know. And spores look kind of funny when they germinate on agar. Like sometimes they're kind of fuzzy and kind of weird. Like you're like, I want rhizomorphic growth. And I'm like, well, you got mycelium growth. Is that good for you? You know, like <laughs> that's how I feel. Like, yeah, all these other things in the industry of like this is better than that and all that. I don't really play with that either. It's like you, you're, you got some mycelium growing. Amazing. You know, and so that's what will lead to. Um, if you guys want to, yeah, actually, this is kind of similar of how it might look like. Uh, oh, that is from spores. Yeah. Ah, see, I was like, this might be how it would look like if a spore germinated. It, it is. It's from a spore print. So I do know something about what I'm talking about. That's good. Um, and if you want to pass these, it's always nice. You're in the right room. Um, and you can kind of see, so these are agar transfers, and you'll see the one that says spore print. So those are where you're getting a little bit more of the mycelium that's already been like cultured from other plates, and it's a little bit more selective, you know? And the spore print one's good to notice, because you're like, oh, like, is this contamination? Like, why is it so fuzzy? Like, why is it looking like this? Well, it's not, you know, it's just, uh, it's just how spores will germinate and then you'll select, you'll take a little piece of that and move it onto another plate, right? Um, cool, so then the next stage of this is understanding, like we just inoculated a bag, that bag is gonna grow and become this, right? This is a fully colonized bag, very similar to that, that has my seal. And I'm gonna pass this around too. And even notice everything about this bag. Notice the patch, how it's tied, like all that type of stuff, and we can talk about that too. Can you can we hurt it? You can hurt it. I mean, but I mean like. Oh, oh! If if hurt if you can do that, do yeah. that. Because okay. we're gonna be breaking this up. Okay, like, I just we're gonna be putting I this in the tub. You're, you're already doing great. I think that, that motion is going to be perfect. Do you, well, um, after you inoculate, do you just let your bags sit until they're fully done, or do you help them at any point, like speed them up and give them a little shade? 
Yeah, I mean, like, sometimes, like, it's either, like, you can do the rule, a lot of people will say, like, 33% break it up, 77% right. break it up, and then leave it, right? So you kind of break it up twice. Sometimes your mycelium grows so fast that, like, you just let it get to halfway, and then you kind of break it up, you know? I like that method I a usually lot. Do yeah, I like that way. method a lot. I've seen just a better... I don't know, because then when it kind of it has when it has those more points to con recolonize from, it goes pretty quick from there, it seems. Yep. So exactly. Yeah. You let the bag colonize about halfway instead of fully like that? Yeah. 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 It'll, be, it'll be like pretty much about half. I started half out with like uh, white, you know, half is okay. colonized. Yeah, this time I won't even touch points. Like, I'll just forget about them. Like, oh, there's three in the back. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you're written, this is the power of the mycelial network, right? Like, it's not about me, it's not about what we're doing, really. It's about us coming together so that all the information can be shared. I mean, that's pretty much how this information is going to run until now. It's that's not it, like, dude. Like, now we're doing it. It's a so like, like nothing. It's just like, yo, we want. I love meeting people, honestly, that randomly, like at a show yeah. or something randomly, and they're like, oh yeah, I called me. I'm like, yo, what's up? <laughs> you want to talk for like three hours? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you consider when choosing your brain? Right, I forgot what you were doing. What do I consider when choosing my brain? Um, what's available? I, like, I mean, like, I don't know. It's here, I go through it the same way. Like, what do I, what do I go, I go to the store, the, the Safeway or something, and what do I think? I was like, what do I want to eat tonight? You know what I mean? Like, there's going to be a lot of choices for that. Like, as far as personal cultivation, I'm not teaching you commercial cultivation, okay? That's not the conversation. That's like consulting. That's a whole other realm, right? And there's other people here that I can connect you with that would be the people to really talk to you about that. You know, I've done some of that, but what I want you to have is more of just this, like, freedom to cultivate however you want um, and explore and experiment. Because there's going to be things that come up with all this that uh, might be confusing, and you have to meet that with like, oh, isn't that interesting? You know, uh, why why did all these things contaminate? Oh, isn't that interesting? You know what I mean? Like, let's just look at my process, look at what I started with, like, let's look at all the things I did, just to see how I can refine this process for myself. You know what I mean? And so that's that's we're developing like who you are as a scientist, as a mycologist, as a citizen. That's like a cosmic cultivator. That's my thing, right? Like it's like embodying this more like community aspect of it. Um, and so when I'm choosing my brain, it really is usually just what's available. Now, but millet is a great option. You know, one of the theories about it is that once it's colonized, then you have all of these little individual uh, inoculation points that become very pervasive in whatever you're putting them in. You know, I. I I, t I see that too. You know, it's like you, you do see it. It colonizes pretty fast. It colonizes really well. You have a little bit less contamination issues from my experience. Um, but the things that people will generally use, because this is like a 101 class, uh, is corn, wheat, hard wheat, uh, millet, um, brown rice even, you know, like the, the Uncle Ben's tech. If you like go ahead and go and get, listen, that's nothing, nothing I would ever tell you to do because everyone who's ever tried to make me do that, it, it just never works. Um, for all the things I've done over the years, I kind of It just doesn't it. sound like it should work. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Uncle Ben's tech is like, do you really trust Uncle Ben? And, you know, and that's, that's the first question. <laughs> do you trust your Uncle Ben? Bags didn't work, but I haven't agreed, so. I know, see? Yeah. And we're pretty successful in other areas, you know what I mean? And so, uh, but but what we're looking at is that you don't want to use legumes, right? You're not, you're not, and I don't want to get into it too much, but like you're not using beans and stuff, but you're using grains. Things that most like animals will feed on. Buckwheat is like, at least from a flower standpoint, I've used a lot of that. Buckwheat's highly, highly nutritious. Um, I've used purple sweet potato for nutritious uh, things as well. We're kind of getting more into like liquid culture and agar making that stuff, so but we'll get there. Um, but just going over what nutrients they want, they want something that can be broken down to simple sugars. There's a reason why you can use like liquid culture and just put um, dextrose in it, which is what? What is dextrose? Sugar. Yeah, it's D-glucose. It's like, the, it's what your body uses. You know, it's like, this is like, we're looking at ATP, right? Like adenosine triphosphate. We're, we're kind of operating off of similar principles for the mushrooms. We just want to give them the most simple things to grow, and then they're going to do the rest. They're going to do the rest. So we just inoculated the bag. 
where you knock it in the bag. And then we're kind of like maybe doing more of the stuff that gets us to the point, right? To the point of uh, putting a tub together. Who hasn't done culturing work before? Yeah? You want to try it? Sure. Okay, great, man. Take a seat. Nice. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Here you go. Take a seat. Take a seat. Um, you got some gloves? Perfect. Here, and be very careful with this, but I'm going to pass this around while I get some of this stuff set up. Take a look at the needle, take a look at the, the what, what that contraption is if you haven't seen it before. And if you stab yourself, that's on you. If you stab somebody else, also <laughs> on you. Like, don't, basically don't stab. Um, <laughs> have you heard that as a life lesson before? Um, I mean, I've said that. Have you? <laughs> yeah, we say, we say that conversation. Don't stab. <laughs> um, you store your plates upside down. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, you can store them either way. It's more of just how they ended up in the bag for the most part. Um, storing them upside down, you know, there's sometimes condensation that happens in there. And, uh, and so for me, if it's upside down, then when I open it, like in front of the flow head, I'll kind of like flick that water out and put the lid back on. You know what I mean? So, that, so maybe. You're asking me a question that I don't always think about, where I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, it's more of like um, a procedural thing. Like, I think that out. that's standard in lab practice. It is, yeah, it's I learned standard it in lab. lab. It's standard lab practice to yeah. throw them upside 17 down. 17 to 21 that's... degrees. So, what was that? If you pour it 17 to 21 degrees and leave them in for a little bit for like 30 to 40 minutes, no mm -hmm. condensation. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. then you don't have to get the top one that will have con mm -hmm. condensation, mm -hmm. like another mock plate, or like more mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. So cells, that's Celsius, right? 17 to mm -hmm. 21. Um, I think that range is probably, I, you have to look it up. I know that 107 yeah. degrees. 117 fair, to 120. 117 yeah. to 124. I'll, like, I'll start pouring at 124. Yep. I get a little bit of condensation, but like yep. 117 to 121. 117 to 121. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I didn't hear that. <laughs> I was like, well, I think that's still in the 70s. You don't want agar and you don't want condensation. That's what I found. Yeah. Yeah, so, so... Just um, because they won't grow through the condensation. Yeah, so let's, we'll bring it back in here. Give me one second. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so, yeah, when you're working with agar, 107 degrees Fahrenheit is where it's going to solidify. So what she is saying, that pouring it between 117 and 124, meaning that starting there, by the time you're done, it's, do you know what I mean? So you're starting higher, so that by the time you're done, you're not getting really, really thick. Agar. So you're getting to learn a little bit about the thing that's right in front of you. So that's good because we're not going to be pouring agar today. Um, and I also want to highlight the fact that like these are things that if the, the cost wise, if you're moving into like commercial cultivation or wanting to do this in a way that you're like moving ounces, moving pounds, doing the thing, fucking, you know, mushroom trap house. Uh, I don't know. I, I understand that these things fucking exist. Um, oh my god. So weird, you know what I mean? It gets trippier. I like that better though. You know, I like I'm that ready better. for the rap music from that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get Tipper in there, you know? Um, is, uh, is having an understanding that there are people out there that will supply you plates. There are people out there that will supply you bags. There are, you know, and cost wise, all of this will work out, you know, at least where the industry is at right now. So the cost, I think they said before, is like four to seven dollars or something like that to make 100 grams dried of mushrooms. 100 grams dried of mushrooms, ten dollars a gram. I think you all went to school, you know what I mean? Like you can kind of figure that out, right? I think a thousand dollars is more than seven dollars. Okay, so yeah, margins. So so <laughs> this guy with the mushroom hat understands those things too. Right? It's just that's not the thing I live in now. You know, this is my thing. So, um, so if you're moving in that direction, I guess I want to empower you to not have to feel like you have to do every part of the process. Because what the mycelial network really is, is being able to resource from all the other nodes right. that exist as well. So we want to empower other people to do their thing so that you can do your thing. Because if you start doing all of it, you might feel overstretched, and you also may not continue cultivating. And the number one thing I want you to do is to keep cultivating, keep growing mushrooms. So the next step here is going to be yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, if you want to put some gloves, I'm only doing gloves. So I actually don't work with gloves that often. But I also don't, you know, 
bringing you guys to wash your hands and to do all this type of stuff, it's a lot easier for me to just have you put gloves on, spray your hands down with a little bit of isopropyl, and then you can pull some of the plates out that we're gonna be working with. Amazing, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I see now why this is happening. Um, and we have a beautiful gift here too. Someone had brought spore slides the other day, yesterday. I don't know if they're here, you brought them? Yeah. yeah, amazing. So this is the mycelial network at work, right? Like, so we get to experience that. And now we're gonna probably take some of these spores and put them on agar plants in a little bit. But for now, we're gonna start with just agar transfers, and then we can move into doing some of these other things also, okay? So I'm gonna resource you, make sure you have the resources to do some of this stuff. Um, they're pretty cool though, huh? Yeah. Um, and yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to here, right here. Yeah. Cool, and just rub it. You can even go up to your forearms a little bit if you need to, but you know, alcohol can be hard on our skin, like really hard. And like when you're doing this a lot, like you're gonna get real dry. You already live in basically Arizona in the mountains. You know, like I just moved from there. Like I get it. Um, so now his hands are clean, right? Oh, where did that needle go? Thank you. I have this in my hands. So. Okay. Okay, so what's perceivably, let's see what we're working with here. I don't know, you choose one. You choose one. What, what one do you want to take home? We'll make that choice. Great. Oh, the, the A slash GT. That does look exciting. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I've rooted that one yet, so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But really, it's good. It's still mycelium, and, I, and it will grow. Um, awesome. So the next step is open your plate. See that little, yeah, there you go. And what are you peeling off this right now? Do you know what it's called? I do not. Yeah. So that's parathum. These are more, oh, leave it closed, yeah. And then uh, we, see here, so does anyone have a lighter? I have a lighter. Where do you get the parathum? Amazon. You can ask me that question probably about a lot of things, and the answer is going to be probably Amazon. It's usually where I get most yeah. of so. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> See this? <laughs> see how it's bending the lighter? <laughs> See how it's bending the lighter? It's bending the lighter all the way out here. Right? The flame. Even here. See how consistent it's pretty pretty this is what laminar flow is. So we can work probably in this whole range. Pretty common. I've left this on for a while just so that it actually is like cleaning the room as well. We're gonna be you know, there's only so much, there's no pre-filter. No pre filter on this. We forgot it at home, you know what I mean? Um, so that's me giving you a, a, like an understanding of where you can work. And the next stage is going to be having access to the tools you're going to be working with, right? And so we want to get the plates out that you're going to use. And so we're going to do two plates because we're going to do a sport print and that. Careful, yeah, we're grabbing it with the plate at the bottom, flipping it over, great. Great. Great, 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 great. Um, you can see how quickly things can kind of get like crazy over here. Um, there we go. And so uh, the first thing that I would invite you to do is to take the lid. I'll even just show you this. It's like, kind of do that, right? Yeah, if you want to do it for the other one. Yeah, that one doesn't have as much. Oh, close it. Yeah, so what's the number one rule with like, even, even when you're working in front of a photo? Like, it's sort of the five second rule, right? Like, everything that you're opening, especially agar and like anything that's like liquid culture, liquid culture, man, you know, you know how many people that I've like consulted for when they're doing big lab grows and stuff, and they're like, bro, like, I have 250 liquid cultures, we're about to hit like 300, you know, 3,000 bags, and like, this is gonna go, and I'm like, you're gonna fail. For sure, you're gonna fail for sure. You know why? Because you cannot, like, if you're going to rely on all that liquid culture being clean, and then you're just going to run, and you're going to do this cannabis thing, and just, you know, it's like, you're going to fail. They did. 
complete failure, three hundred thousand dollars down the road. You know what I mean? Like just like selling stuff back to us. <laughs> and that's not the laughing is like I had a lot of care in my heart for like helping them, but they didn't want to listen, right? So can only do so much. So that's why keeping things closed and making sure that if we're gonna open Agar, we're only gonna like open it as long as we need to and then close it, even when we're working in front of the closet. So uh, with this stage of it, we're gonna move this, and I'm gonna help you operate this, but we're gonna sterilize the, the scalpel, okay? And so in this case, just so that it's like for visual, yep, see, there we go, we're good. And you can also just do this. usually sterile usually. I mean, you know here's the thing right like why why would we not just put isopropyl alcohol on that yeah but no but you microscopically that steel isn't just flat right do you know what I mean it's, it's it's somewhat porous like even even how it's made and stuff like that so the the heat heat sterilization is always going to do the job if I just do the the rubbing alcohol and as lab practice no good because it's not going to fully sterilize it. There's going to be bacteria in some of those crevices that don't get there, and then when you put it in the agar, it comes off, right, or something like that, you know? And so then you're just inoculating it with something you don't want. You can be really good at growing other things. We're just trying to be really good at growing mushrooms, right, or cultivating the, the soil and cultivating the mycelium and then giving them a chance. So, hey, guys. Um, so, so with this, then we're going to move into a place, so that's sterile, and then, uh, yeah, and then so with this, you see how there's this, usually I'll do like a demonstration, but I trust you, right, like, uh, there's, there's like a little triangle that's been cut out of it, yeah, that's all you're going to have to do, you're in front of a flow hood, if we we're doing this in a sterile air box, there'd be a little bit more care, but you do have, I want you to also know how much freedom you have, I can leave that, 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 I got to play it open for a minute and it'll be fine. I'm just giving you the best practices for the lab. So it's a balancing of anxiety versus the reality. The reality is, is that this flow hood works really well. This man behind you made it um, and I trust it. So when we do this, we can open it up. Feel free to open it up. So I'm not going to see how we kind of keep backing around. You don't want to breathe on things. Cut a, cut a triangle off. You might want to, yeah. Grab it. Yep. Let's put the lid back on. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Is that okay to use the lid a little bit to like? You know, so we try not to, right? Because like when we think, when we're really diving into this process of like, we, we think about every little thing. Do I know that the corner of the lid is is clean? You know, maybe, probably not, I don't know, you know, so so you did fine, and it's going to be fine, probably. My experience of doing that is that it usually is clean, you know, because especially it's this plastic, there's not a lot that's going to go on it. Um, and so, amazing, man. So this is the next step now, is you can put the, the scalpel back down here, and then the next step is, where is that labeling device? There we go. And uh, we're going to label it with the name, you can kind of model this. This was the, ch the second transfer, so you put T3, there's A, GT. Do we have scissors? <laughs> this is why you have a team. You know what I mean, like it's amazing. Okay, so, oh, you wanna do a team? Yeah, I'm not going to go yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so, like, some people earlier were talking about how, like, we'll write the names and stuff, but if you have, like, a coded system, like, where you have a spreadsheet, and you go, the name of this is this number, and all that type of stuff, do that. Like, most professional labs will have that, because it's just, like, you kind of have to relate it back to some sort of, like, Dewey Decimal, so, yeah, Master Sheet, and all that. This A lot of this is stuff that we use in classes, and for, like, teaching. You know, and this is the way that most people start. So, so now you have that. Now, what's the next stage for the plates? For both the plates? For both plates? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you took it off, right? And so he just cut some parafilm. Yeah. Here. 
and I can show you, have you done it before? No, okay. I think this is a good thing to kind of show people, um, and I'm doing this just because this is something that is supposed to be clean going on to something else that's clean. You know, so I'm putting my hands on the thing that's gonna be the breathing membrane for the plate, right? And so, I'm gonna show you guys. This is the original plate. This is a little bit easier. This is a tissue culture plate. It has a ledge mm -hmm. on it, so it's a lot easier to do, actually. And so I hold it with one finger. You know, it's like Laffy Taffy, and you just allow for the plate to provide the pressure. Right? Is there a reason you it's kind of the triangles over and over shape? Um, well, because four cuts is more than three cuts, and two cuts is ha is wouldn't be able to get it out, right? What about a circle? Well, then I have to go like this. So if you have, <laughs> oh, like three cuts, like yeah, like three that. incisions. Yeah, I'm just, oh, so I, okay. like, like, <laughs> like, I got, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna meet you where you're at, right? Because like, if you're gonna ask me that question, I'd be like, well, you know, because when you do two cuts, nothing's gonna come out. Yeah. And then the third cut is where it comes out. The fourth cut is the next cut. <laughs> you can even make a, you can even make a trapezoid, I think. Um, you know, uh, what you want, the concepts, these are the basic concepts is mycelium on something else is gonna grow on. However you get it there, because they have the hole punch things, which are really cool, and then a lot of people, when you talk about expediency, then you might make all the cuts at first, like if I know I'm gonna make 10 transfers, I'll make 10, all 10 cuts, and just like around the side, or whatever. This is a fully colonized plate. This plate's really old, right? Usually I would do transfers a little bit newer, right? So right here, this is the next one, because you, you chose this one, so that's totally fine. But then this one would be a really good one to like transfer, because it's pretty new. And you can see, you can have information of how the mycelium is growing. You know what I mean? So I'm gonna pass this around just, Think about that, you know, like, there's a reason if you look at Roger Rabbit's text, if you look at some of these other things, uh, there's a reason why you might, might, uh, you might do the transfers within the first week, because you see the mycelium that's growing. That's the fastest, strongest growing mycelium. It's grew, grew first, you know? So it's that idea that we're gonna follow some sort of phenotypic line to then uh, influence how our mushrooms grow in the future. How much of the um, agar do you want off the plate when you take a sample, do you take all of it? Or are you just, when you cut out your triangle, how deep into the agar do you go? Oh, that's interesting. Well, it's sort of the same question, right? Because I've seen they, people just lift, like, like just lift the mycelium, and then I've seen other people dig really deep. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, no, awesome. Doesn't matter, not for what you're doing. I'm sure there's maybe their own reasons, sure. and they can give you those, but like at the end of the day, the mycelium is just gonna grow mm -hmm. off of it. And so the, the other question, and so why don't you do this one? Yeah, feel free. Thank you for waiting. Mm -hmm. You guys have been, you guys are the best students. Um, do you ever do agar to grain? Yeah. Yeah, we do agar to grain all the time. Yeah, yeah. Do you do grain? That's okay. That's okay. So careful with our strength. <laughs> That's okay. It might be a lesson. You know? It's like we move like water, like we, we're strong like water, we're strong like, you know, we don't have to force our way, overexert ourselves, and we get to confidently use our energy however we want. Um, yeah, no, you're doing, this is great. So, so you kind of heard the, that right there, you know? And so what we could even do, if you feel so called, it's probably gonna be fine. It's probably gonna be fine, but we can also take a piece of parathone and wrap it around that. If you, you know what I mean? Like, why, why not, right? We can do that. Why don't you get a few more pieces, just cut like a, yeah, if you want to just, oh, you do? Yeah. See, the, you don't even gotta train this guy. You know, you know, the, the homie. You don't even gotta train this guy. He already knows what's going on. Um. I've broken plates, absolutely. Like I've, I've absolutely broken plates doing that, and uh, and that's this is this is what I'm talking about, you guys. Like it's it's real. It's like you become more aware of yourself. This is a meditative practice that you like start diving into, and you're like, oh wow, there's like all these other things I'm learning about myself. 
maybe Love was right. You know what I mean? Like, maybe he was. Maybe he's full of shit. I don't know. You know, but like, at the end of the day, I do know that your experience will, will, will change and be different. And this is for you, sir. This is yours. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shows a good train there. I'm excited to see that. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! So, how Yay. long until he starts seeing growth on that? How long do you think? Well, within a week. Within a week. Like, this is also that place of, like, uh, not looking to experts, right? Because there aren't any. Like, it's like trusting our intuition, like trusting, like, that we probably know the answers. I, I really am only here to open the door. You know, that was the same thing in Guatemala. I remember that being the case, and I don't think they understood it. And at the end, they're like, oh, it's like, we were all the medicine. Like, we were the teachers. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> we got there. <laughs> um, so the next stage, then, is that who else wants an uh, opportunity? We can do this forefront onto the, yeah? Come on, then. Whew. There is a water necessity. There's a water bottle, but what's right here? Gloves? Yeah, man. Yeah, put some gloves on. Is there a limit to running like a single clone? Um, like with the number of transfers, or I've heard people go from green back to no. Agar. Like, have you ever noticed something? Weird There's a limit if it's not locked in. It is not locked in. Like, if you're coming from the cannabis culture, you might understand that. Like, like the way things grow. When you're, you're thinking about genetics, when you think about genetics like a big tree. You know what I mean? And so some of the some of the paths it takes it end, and it's like, oh, fuck. You know what I mean? And then, and then you want to come back to whatever that master culture that was growing really well, get some spores from it, and then keep finding where it's going to go. Like, I know people who have been using the same culture for four years. Where do you think, what do you think Mike Tyson, the guy who does all the lines vein on Instagram, is? Like, he got his cultures from the Netherlands, from a big mycelium bank. You may not know this. Share this with you. I know this because Jasper and we were talking about it when we were in Guatemala because they're getting some of the same stuff, right? And so they want to get the same stuff, and like that's been going for years. You know what I mean? So this is the level of like expertise we want to get to when it comes to like making sure that you're also giving somebody a culture that's going to produce, right? Like we want more mushrooms, you know? And the ways that we navigate that for ourselves is that if you can at least get one flush out of something that someone gave you, then you can get spores from that. And that's the best resource you can have to keep you know, perpetuating your own sort of like uh, library or this becomes sort of like a legacy that you, that you may hand down to your kids, may hand to your friends, you know what I mean? It's in your will, it's like, yo, if I die, you get that culture. That's in my, that's my shit, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I get that, and like, and especially when you start kind of like developing a relationship with it, this girl knows all too well that jar right there, you know, right? That's the one. Dude. That's the one. That's the one. She brought that here. Why don't you come tell us a little bit about it? So this is Thrasher and my homie and um. Well, see, see her passion. You know? Michigan, don't do yeah, that. Yeah, come on. So Michigan, like, grew this, inoculate your mind, and it is a beautiful isolation of the penis envy and some other things. But I look like giant jellyfish that they like throw down on tubs, but it should be kind of finicky. Obviously on grains and rhizo, she's been really happy and aggressive and consuming this Milo like I'm crazy. Yeah. Let's see he overfills his jars, so like let's get a little technical here. When you do your jars, a lot of you probably are like, why is it so full? This never gets shaken. He allows them just to kind of sit and like dormant like this. And by he, she's talking about her partner. Yeah, my partner. My partner yeah. is... Was here a second ago, yes. <laughs> but, so what he does is he likes to just leave them sit and like let the mycelium do its thing. He doesn't disturb them. Like A lot of people that grow out of bags will shake them and kind of spread the mycelium further. And you can do that and it makes it go faster. You always get like a lot of... It'll like kind of stump them and then they'll like, be happy again and they'll come out, but in different areas. But this one specifically was like a third clone from a mushroom. You can clone directly from the tissue. You can put it on an agar plate and it'll grow. And then you get something that's supposed to be stronger. We, we're not 100% sure yet. 
we're going to see how it does and then hopefully grab another isolation from that or some spore prints or some swabs and then keep going with it but this one's like I've been pumping this one up a lot and for production that I need to be done this is like perfect and it, they look like giant dicks dude the size of my hand like of course who doesn't want that <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, oh, yeah, pretty universal, right? <laughs> Show this. Yeah. <laughs> How long ago was that? <laughs> I knew we'd make so it back to sex. So, 331. Oh, wow. So this is all, like, just like this bag, you know, almost over a month. Yeah. So we just really, like, let's let them sit. We hit problems sometimes when we're shaky. Okay, like, we're hitting mad grain problems, and that's, like, a whole other thing, but jars are awesome. I suggest doing jars when you're starting out. Yeah. Uh, switching to bags is like, well, this definitely like takes some, some fine tuning. Some finessing. Yeah, and some fine tuning for sure. Some money. Sorry, not a, lot of, a lot of learning. Yeah, we have a love hate relationship with bags. I feel so you. I'm going to go take this and go. Show them too. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Thank you. I love what you're doing, by the way. Yeah. This is awesome. Um, are you bringing that back? Is there a way that we can culture that? Because <laughs> things can happen in your house. Okay, cool. Thank you. So like, it's a gift. Right. Yes. But like, keep I see. I know, and I've all of a sudden grown attached as well. <laughs> Please keep it close. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, strands out there that people want job. to give their hands on, and this is like kind of one of them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Honey. Yeah. Yeah. This is how it works. You know what I mean? Like, uh, we 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 always are in the space with gratitude. Like, because for for many of us, it's about the relationship first. It's about like us coming together, respecting each other as cultivators, and also like supporting the future of this. You know, because there's going to be people who come in here who run companies, who run boards, who have never even been with mushrooms before. That's insane. You want people who have never even tried mushrooms deciding how you get mushrooms? And what kind you get? And what kind you get? And, and how much you get? And all that's not going to happen. Where That's you're allowed like, to get them? Should have yeah. 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 Prosecutors should go yeah. to prison too, man. Like, you feel it out for a little yeah. bit before you send people yeah. to life. This is right up there with like, you know, there's oh, always yeah. such things as an unhealed healer. Yeah. You know, like, oh, yeah. you, you have to have gone process. through the process right. yourself. <laughs> you have to have done these things yourself first before you can do it for someone else. That's just basic human humanness, you know? And so that's why, like, I, this is my role right now because I have done these things along with other things. And I moved a lot more into ceremony, a lot more into you want to change in your life, we're doing it. We're doing it overnight. This is how it goes, though. This is where it starts. you got to cultivate your own mushrooms, though. And I think that's one of the, the, the beautiful gifts that you can do for yourself is to cultivate your own medicine and then take your own medicine. That's what started this for me, you know, 15 years ago. So um, what are we doing? Sport agar. Sport agar, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You already kind of did the glove thing? Yeah. All right, so we have the sport print right there. Yeah. Is sport there any way you can, um, before we get to that, explain how you get the sport print off? Yeah. Like, uh, like something for other Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so how, let me, let me ask you, this is where we will have like the same sort of like, at least probably basic intuition. If you're walking in a forest and you see a mushroom, and you see it at a certain stage where it's like, doesn't look like the cap, like you're gonna see them in various stages, right? Where it's like super close, if it has a veil, veil, not all do, you know, like, but these ones do. If they have a veil, um, then it's gonna be going like this. And you wanna catch it, really where it's gonna drop spores is right as it's breaking the veil. Right, right. You know, because after it's broken the veil, actually it done it, it might have dropped some, but then it's still gonna drop more, it might even drop more from there, right? Um, and so a little, what's a little trick you, you give people? So I, I guess I walk you through that. Let me ask you first then, what do you think you would do to get the spores? Put something underneath to catch it? Yeah. Yeah, like you just take the cap off that mushroom, right? Oh, you, can, you, rip, you take it off? Well, because like the cap for the mushroom, like imagine my hand is the right. cap. Well, you, 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 can just twi you just grab, you don't need to touch, you, you know, you can like just grab the cap on the side and you can literally just twist the cap on this, or the stem on. Why not just take the whole thing out and then just do it that way? Will it keep growing if you well, it grow a new cap? Okay, these are, we're getting, Sorry, I, I, got, I asked a lot of questions. No, no, no. But I just want us to, like, this is where, like, uh, I know you I know you know the answer to this, right? You can't just take a mushroom and just stand it up on top of a plate and it's going to do this, right? You have to, I'm taking the cap off so that that's where the spores are going to leave, right? That's So I'm going to cut, or you can cut the stem, but you want to cut it. You know, think about the logistics of this. You're just trying to get the spores out of the cap. 
So you're going to take that, that cap, and once it's off the mushroom, somehow, you decide, um, put it on foil. Foil? <laughs> yeah, foil. I mean, yeah, you put on some foil. Foil is highly conductive, right? It's, it's inherently antimicrobial. Copper, even more so. So if things are really conductive, why does it make it antimicrobial? Because microbes survive off the electricity. So when they when they go in there, then it's like they get zapped, like they can't operate because it, all the electricity is being conducted and all this stuff. You know what I mean? So that's why copper is really really good. Even things like um, I mean, gold is for a different reason actually, but like but with copper, it's the conductivity. You know, so it disrupts the way that uh, living organisms are going to live. Foil. Similar, not as much, but that's why we can reasonably put it on a piece of tin foil, and then you might put like a bowl over it. You know, you might even put the bowl inside another inside another tub, so that if you're thinking about it in your house, you want it to be as clean as possible where the spores are going to drop. You know, so you might even like clean the foil before you do it with isopropyl, let that evaporate, and then you put the the the, the cap on that foil, and then what's one more thing you can do? What do you do? You told me this. Yeah, yeah when the cap to help it drop spores. Drop oh, the I didn't water. say that. Okay, I'm saying I you do that, but no, I didn't. I don't oh, do you don't do that? No. Oh, so <laughs> yeah, you can put like a drop of water on it sometimes. Yeah. So like, if it's not dropping the spores, or if maybe you caught it like too soon, um, sometimes if you put a drop of water on it, it'll help. Um, help it want to open up. Yeah, yeah, so I think part of it is an osmotic effect. Like, it's sort of like how pine cones uh, open and close with rain, you know? Like, it's the humidity, it's like the, it's, it's the intracellular, like how it's operating. So I think what it might be is that the mushrooms are already probably starting to dry out a little bit, and you're putting water on it, it's like absorbing, and then it, it like does this, you know? That might be wrong, it's on live. Let me know. Uh, is it just I'm one, sure you will. Is it just one spore print per cap? Oh, you can, it'll drop, sometimes it'll drop its spores like twice. Like you can like have one spore print, you can move it over and it'll drop it again, right? Am I wrong? No. Is either spore drop more like... Some people will say the second worse. spore print is cleaner. That makes sense. Yeah, just because, because the stuff that's closest to the surface, it dropped, and then you're keeping it in that sterile environment, and then it's dropping it again, and then it's it's being done in an actual clean environment. So that's where I think that rationale is that, yeah, it probably is. It, it is going to be the cleaner one. If you do this by numbers, you'll probably find a lot less contamination rate if you're taking that straight to grain. It's like, that's where, and I have spore sources where I trust, I could take their spores and put it on grain. I feel confident. But generally, I'd be like, ah, you know, do that. Do it as an experiment, and then also like save some of it though, so that if it does contaminate, then you still have the spores you can use them in a different way. Always treat this as an experiment, and just know that your resource is the spore, or the resource is the mycelium. Um, is there any accuracy to like how close the uh, like what your grow out of the spore is? from the actual time that you pull? Like, should you grab like a healthier one as compared to one that's not so healthy? I really like how you're thinking. I really do, because I do not know the answer to that at all, but I do know that that's where we should be going. Like, science operates first off of observation. Phenotypes, like, like trying to track, oh, like what you just said, that's the scientific thought. With, with like the type of mushroom cap or the health of the mushroom cap, impact the spores or the mushrooms that would grow from the spores? I don't know. I really don't. That sounds amazing. That sounds like an amazing experiment though. Um, and that is the direction that this industry is going. And that could be your lane. Like, you know, that's what I mean. And like, do that so I can promote. Like, if you want to do an Instagram thing, okay, hey, bro, like, look at this guy. He's doing this experiment. You know what I mean? Like, that's sort of what we can do because we're not all going to be able to do all the, all the experiments. Okay, so um, I like where your head's at, and uh, I like where your head's at, right here. <laughs> physically. Yeah, yeah, physically. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's only here physically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome. So uh, what do you think are the next steps for where we're at? I would say it's either opening them up, then sterilizing them. The knife, just sterilizing the knife, 
Kind of things up to yeah, you got it. You got to it. Well, I usually have two choices, right. you know, and we'll figure out which one is usually right. Sometimes we hit it the first. Sometimes it's like always the second, right? So why don't we sterilize the scalpel? I'll help you out with this. Perfect. Yep. And then, uh, ooh. So why don't we put the scalpel down, right? Lay it down blade off the thing. So that's gonna sit there chill, right? It's chilling in front of a flow hood that's blowing really well. Um, one thing you might also notice, you're like, Chris, aren't the plates like kind of below the airflow? They are. Sometimes you raise stuff up so that it'd be right in the airflow. What I have found, especially with this flow hood, we haven't had any issues at all, right? Mm -hmm. Down in the room, yeah. Um, so, so don't worry too much. This is right here. What's the next step that we should probably do so that you're ready to do this next thing? Okay. Take the tape off the slides, yeah? Okay. Does it say what type of scores those are on there? I believe they're sign essence. They're sign essence, pan sign ends, or still sign ends. Yeah, 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 yeah. Things are gonna get Things confusing. Pans, pans versus philosophies. What, what's the difference between a philosophy sign essence and a pan an alias sign essence? What's one difference? What? Yeah, exactly. So the pans are wood loving. All cubes are done loving. Yet we'll grow, not on them. Because like I will teach you guys what we're teaching, and what we'll at least show you is using core, coca coir, vermiculite, gypsum. Yeah, most people don't want to work with them in their house. Yeah, but we do have some of the stuff here, actually. So we, we did bring it so you can kind of see it too. Yeah, because um, that is going to be the tub we're going to put together. Mm -hmm. Ah, we have both. Yeah, we have both. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so how are we feeling? Can you tell what side of the slide has the spores probably? <laughs> what one is the cover? Right, that's it. That one, it's darker, right? Yeah. On the side, so. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, if you even like get in. Oh, let's go. Of course. Mm -hmm. Do I know how many people are on it, Trey? Where's Trey? 11. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we were just talking. Okay, cool. So you got that, right? And then, and then, what do you think the next stage is? I would assume opening the having the agar open and then opening the second since it maybe seems a little more touchy to then scrape off. Yeah, yeah. Like the way that I would probably be handling this, yeah, feel comfortable with that because we we do have the flow head here. Right. But just be careful. Like probably do it That's a little bit closer. Kind of what I was um, and this is what is he doing? What am I? I'm not even telling you, but like planning our steps. Yeah. Like planning every one of these steps because you really want to do this right in like all of your effort You want it to work, right? Yeah, when you put a bunch of time in and it messes up later on, it's really oh annoying. It's honestly soul crushing. It's, so, yeah <laughs> <laughs> Crushing of the soul um, Cool, yeah, so why don't we open the plate and then um, move into the next stage and You can kind of move as fast as you need to Closer Hands closer, right? And then just literally scrape it off. Yeah, so use your dominant. Yeah, you can kind of do that, and you can just uh, get some of these in here. Scrape the No, just a little. You only need one score. There's millions. And it might even be something if you can't see them falling, you can take the scalpel and make sure you have some on there, and you can. Got Swipe it. it on. You got it? Oh, you got it. Beautiful. It so let's cover that spore print back up. We'll cover the, the grain plate too, or the agar plate. Amazing. Amazing. Why don't we do um, another plate and you can do an agar transfer while you're up here? You want to do that? Party on. Party on, man. Yes. So uh, you already have this. That's something that we'll re sterilize. And then we need um, more agar plates. Oh, I have them back there. No, yeah, why don't we do this one? You want a nice ape? Yeah. yeah. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> why, wouldn't I? <laughs> why wouldn't I? You do? It's all been about the penises lately, so. <laughs> okay, why don't we grab, uh, why don't you grab a few plates out? Because we'll do this for, for everyone else, too. Okay. Uh, the slides, when, when you put it back, is it pretty important to put the same side that was against the spores yeah. back because the other side was probably going to be contaminated? Yeah, yeah, the clean, the clean. I'm yeah, sure. clean, the clean. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you. What? I'm gonna eat That's fine. Yeah, you're doing great. You're doing great. Trust you. Go ahead and wrap that one. So yeah. Well, we'll need to label it, right? So we're gonna do the labeling and the wrapping. I just want to get us ready for the next stage. Um, you have that. Um. Yep. Yeah. It's the mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Reflex is like a mushroom. Uh huh. There you go. Sure. Denver Mycology. What is parafilm really used for? Is it like a... It, this is, is what it's used for. It's not like a lab thing. No, it, it is. is. For oh, this. Sealing up okay, petri dishes. Cool. Yeah, for, for this. For petri dishes. My first interaction with, with parafilm. Oh, you want to see how to do this? Yeah. It's Just okay. give them that it's quick okay. lesson. Okay. This, this is... This is... Oh. So, like when they, when they just pour like a hundred plates. I love doing it. <laughs> right? And as right. you're pulling it, you'll feel the tension. Feel it, right? Yeah. I can yeah. feel it. So this is why you take your time. Like I'm like boasting oh. on my breath. Like there's I've a lot of things. Everything in this room is definitely like patience. <laughs> Give yourself some patience. Right? Just take a breath. And you Wait feel it. Yeah. Don't even worry about how many times it goes around, okay? We'll get to that. But it's like, just do it. It's gonna go around at least one to two times. That makes me feel okay. So, and we'll do we'll do more. We'll do more. I want to show you that one. Um, but label this, and you're gonna label it from what this was. So this is a side, like P S I N, right? Yeah. Whatever. This is your plate, then. So five nine. Five nine. Dia de la Madre. De la Madre. Okay. Awesome. So we got through that. I see the spores even on it. That's pretty dope, right? Um, and then uh, the next one is going to be, yeah. So you're going to do a, a transfer from a plate. You can flip the plate it? over. There you go. And then, and then with this, yeah, you can flip them over. Right? You guys just peel this off or cut it off or? Yeah, you, you'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, you can get it's close to this. A, that is an eight. I'll buy a penis envy. Yeah, so this is where we get to be the creators, right? Like we just go, well, that part of the messy room looks pretty great. Transfer that. You know, they, this goes deeper. There's more to talk about here, but for where you're starting, like it's just really important to just like have fun with it. For sure. Yeah. I'm so saying, yeah, yeah you want here you got lighter. Lighter works. Lighter works. Oh. Ronnie works. Yeah, okay, you're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> and so by the way, you can like there you go. Can you cut all the way down? Race what it is. I do. Race it's kind of inception. Race it. That's right. It's going to get trippy. You start hanging out with me. Like it. It's, it's kind of stab where you just bomb it up and lift. Stab and lift. And you cut it off. Yeah, that's fine. Just take that look. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that's a good cut, bud. Great job. Yeah. 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 Can I touch it or should I not? No, no, don't yeah, touch okay. it. You can you can act like you're cutting into the other agar though and kind of drag it off if it'll work. There you go. There you go. See? We stumble until we no longer stumble anymore. That's just how it works. We do our best until we know better. So this is what's the next? Uh yeah, there's a light. Is that just different thicknesses of the agar? The spots? Uh. Yeah, it could just be different yeah, points of yeah. whatever these things are. Just go for it now. 
Yeah, so now you think about, now after having that experience, brother, you might think about how you stab it or how you move it, right? And you're like, oh, I want that to be easier the next time. Right, right. Yeah, so that is a good cut. That should pop right out. Yeah. Sexy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yes. Do you want to wrap those two? Yeah, we'll wrap that up. Yeah, but there's no, it'll get all fuzzy, and then if you transfer it again, then you start growing rhizomorphic. You're seeing a lot of really nice rhizomorphic growth yeah, out of that. So it looks so nice. You know, that's, so these are more, these are things that we've been working with for a little bit, and so uh, the, the ape is pretty well producing. That's for you, right? That's for me. Yeah. So he got it from the same girl that she got it from. There's some really master cultivators here. I just want to let you know what you're doing. It's like, um, can you cross the strain just like you do with like yeah, yeah. Presentation, really we can talk about that. I just actually, that was on my last community call. We dove into that with Drew from Inoculate the West. So would you take, uh, does it need to go all the way around? Yes. Yeah. Like an agar plate. But you're good, um, you can, one strain did you, you only get one, one out of there? Yeah, I don't think I then you definitely weren't falling on it. Say you want to combine things that I do with gold and t shirts. That's what I have going right now with gold and t shirts. So, that's awesome. Do you have a better t shirt? And I was like, well, you know, gold and t shirts. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's just yeah. like, a, like one of these agar plates can be used on the main. Oh, okay. Yeah, grab it about that far out and then wrap it. Yeah. And then put it. Oh, that's even better. You're stretching it as you go. Yeah. So. The transfer is that on this T4. It'll be T4. Yeah, it'll be T4. I heard somebody on the. I just got to overlook on the. One of the comments was, "Cool the blade first. By the time that you got to the, yeah, sorry, sure. it was cool. So yeah. like, but yeah, that is something where sometimes uh, if you flame sterilize it, and then you might just take it and dab it on the other agar plate, and you'll hear it sizzle, and that'll kind of like be the first, first cooling if you want to do it that way. You know, you're you're taking something clean to clean, so no worries there. You know, that's the way that we can start thinking too: is what's clean, what is it? You know, and then that dictates how we're gonna like move our hands and everything else that we're gonna do. So uh, you just did two. two did. You did those two. One's for you. One's for someone that you can gift it to at some point, man. You did both. Sweet. Your hands are on these, and this one's you, man. Sweet. Yeah. Thank you. That's how it works. Good okay, yeah, dude. Yeah. 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 And so, what's a question that we might ask from here? You might take these plates home, and you'd be like, Chris, like, what I love, but. Um, what, what, what happens if they're, what they're contaminated? You can transfer them to other agar, like take clean sections, or if there are clean sections, you can transfer it to other agar. Do you think you should be careful about where you do that? Yes. How you do that, if you yes. do it from loaded or not? If you're going to do some of that work, it might be a good idea to have a stellar box. And just do it in there, because if you're doing it in front of the clothing, you're going to blow spores all over your house. Of that contaminated stuff, right? We just become like super aware. We can become super aware of the fact that like everything you're walking around in is full of living life. When I talk about every single atom in this universe being conscious, we can just take a step up and understand that there is actually conscious, there's actually living beings, things all around us, all the time, falling in this air. You know what I mean? And you, the proof is just opening the agar plate in your house, going into the different rooms of your house, and seeing what's living. What's living in your air? You know what I mean? This is what you do in labs. This is what, if I go into a lab, if I go into somebody and they're asking me like all these questions about contamination and stuff, I'll talk to them first and be like, I need you to do a spot test for your whole place first before I get there. You know what I mean? And then we'll have an understanding of a little bit more of what we're doing with and then we can work from there. It's, it's, a, it's like a, a, a puzzle of just trying to figure out maybe how to solve some of the challenges and the problems that we're going to have as a cultivator. You know? And so what he was saying is that like if, if you take these plates home and they end up having something else growing on it that isn't mycelium, then there's an opportunity to take the clean piece of mycelium and put it on another plate. You know? And just being conscientious of how you do that. What what temperature should those be stored at? At home? 
for a while, best growth. Oh, for best growth? What do you incubate at? What? What's the question? What do you incubate your plates at usually? Um, my silly will die at 107, so let's not hit triple digits, guys. Like, don't leave it in your car, you know, do that. We've done that. Yeah, I've done that. I've done that. Um, about 70, I'd say 75, 77, 78. Yeah. You can hit 80s if you want to go faster, but you don't. But it gets a little weird though, like exactly. sometimes. Like it gets yeah. a little weird, and the mycelium starts getting a little like puffier, and like you gotta think because you're increasing the humidity. If you increase temperature, increasing the amount of uh, uh, of the moisture that's gonna be in the air too. You, 75, 77. Yep, that's what I do too. Yep. This is so. You see, this isn't about me. Like the answers are always gonna be around us, all all the time. Um, that's kind of the constant temps for them, huh? Just. Bags that are inoculating the tubs, 75, 77. You can fruit, yeah, you can fruit at the same temperatures. Like sometimes people will fruit between 70 and 74, you know? Um, you know I, any difference there? Have you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it just, yeah, uh, I mean, the lower the temperatures, there's going to be less things that are contaminants that will grow also. Okay, Do you know right. what I mean? So right. you're selecting for that while also seeing that sometimes the mushrooms, depending on what you're growing, like this, the, some mushrooms react differently. Right, but uh, one general trend is sometimes they'll be thicker and they'll be just like denser. They feel hardier because what it seems like is like they're not dealing with such. I don't know. They're like really resourcing. It's like colder. It's like cold growth. I don't know. It, you know, I think we can look into the science. Uh, I've been traveling so much and I haven't looked at many articles recently, and that's something I want to start doing more um, as we move forward to having journal clubs and stuff. You know. Um, I would think the least like fluctuation in the environment would give them the best like growth. Yeah, that is so, like the seventy to seventy four might be less of a fluctuation because the outside temp is also not or it's not as much of a cool temperature. That's a house. That's kind of house temperature for most people. Right. Mushrooms like people, guys. Like if you're comfortable with the temperature, they're comfortable. Yeah. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Like listen, like you're gonna start feeling like I'm. I. You want to know who's a mushroom in this room? Definitely me. Definitely hurt. Like, I don't have a choice in this. There's no going back. You know what I mean? Like, I'm an advocate for this, uh, and they have me, right? So, you know, um, mushrooms are speaking. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, the anthropomorphizing works for the most part here. And then the science comes down to the nuance, really. But the rest of it's like, what do you like? What do they like? That's why I said the store at Algier. I mean, what do you want to eat tonight? Yeah, vary, vary their diet. What's available? What does your local store have? When we were in Guatemala, I grew on chilotes. You might not even know what that is. They're just little baby corn cobs. You know what I mean? And we grew just oysters, open air inoculation, doing all that stuff, cold vine pasteurization, just on chilotes. And then moving those chilotes and using those as spawn for straw in a barrel. And then growing a shit ton of oysters, you know? Nice, dude. Yeah. And so so you even see like some grain bags out here where you can get like some rye, you might even have some like corn and that stuff. The things that you want to stick away from is anything that's gonna get pasty and, and like start getting like affecting the consistency of the thing that you're growing in. Rest of that, they'll break down like you wanna test your mushrooms. That's like sort of like you got them, it's like they're children. You're like, okay, like, you know, like, you're doing great, but now we're gonna treat you with the real world here, you know? We're gonna start testing you in these different environments and see how you do, you know? If Andy was here, I was someone in my organization, he grows mushrooms in vivariums. Has a fucking tarantula living up his cubes. <laughs> yeah. That's the level that you wanna take this to. You wanna take this in the direction of being like, well, that motherfucker's living with a tarantula. You know what I mean? <laughs> are you living with a tarantula? I don't think so. You know what I mean? Nope, not not in the same cage. There's dudes that harvest their weed and then like have all the little mushroom plants underneath them yep. and like breathe into each other. Yep. They will harvest their weed plants and yep. harvest mushrooms and so jelly. Yep. Yep. This is where we're going, right? Like this is like really bringing it into life. Like really, the permaculture. That was a huge thing in Guatemala when I was there. It's all about understanding how energy consolidates and how we move energy. This is what I mean, it's pervasive in every aspect of reality. You can put permaculture principles to everything, to your life as well. So, so that's sort of innovated into this teaching of mycology, this 101. And what, what have we done so far? 
who has a good handle on at least a model of what we've done and what we're moving towards. So we've got mycelium. Yeah. Or we're getting there. Yeah. And then now we need to move to a substrate. Maybe. We're getting close. Yeah. I mean, you know, we 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 did some transfers. We even took spores, the seeds, and we put that on agar. Amazing. So that's going to be cool. This all this is being done in front of a flow hood. If you don't have a flow hood and we want to move into that later, I can show you how still an airbox would work. Like, I want you to come confident that this is the first time you're doing it, you can go home and do all this work. Okay? Um, yeah, brother. Having read many anecdotes on the internet about just do it, still airbox or not, I mean, is that valid if you're just looking to get started? Well, I know you're more like, obviously way more likely to have contamination, can but, you know. We started with the stellar <laughs> yeah. box, and if you have to start there, I would suggest doing this slightly bit more work and making it a glove box with like a lid closed, and you can, it's like much more sterile and we have much less complications. Yeah. For sure. Because there is yeah, a, the stellar box does have a little bit more chances, like you're saying, because yeah. there's air. No, what I'm saying is, is no, uh, no box, like, you know, like I've used a, a kerosene lamp to just have that upper current. Yep. Um, yep. Like, um, like, yep. Wait. I guess That's with, with, tech, with the mind yeah. of having Listen, the, no barrier to entry, you know, yeah. as, or as little as possible. Yeah, so so you, so you the reason I took a pause was just that I, my answer is yeah, man. Like, honestly, like, I trust myself so much in this that, like, there's a lot of things I might do that, like, wouldn't work out for other people, you know? And so that's one of those things, you're doing open air stuff, but having an understanding of some of those concepts, that, that, that dynamic that you work in, he says, well, I would have an open air, like a kerosene lamp, you know, next to it or in that area. Having something that's like generating an updraft and generating like, like burning the air and like making it hot and stuff like that, this is what you use in lab, like a Bunsen burner. Mm -hmm. You have a Bunsen burner going the entire time. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh my god, well it's like, that's literally how it is. Like you go to microbio lab, that's what you're going to do. You know, that's one of my favorite favorite classes, like seven years ago now. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's that's super cool, and I would do that. And just understand that you can go get like, uh, what, what would you use? What's like an easily accessible thing to do that tech? Um, but, you know, right now, the thing going around is the Uncle Ben's uh, rice bags. Oh, you're, you're trying to simplify as much as possible. We're back. Right. <laughs> We're back to Ben. Oh yeah. Um, Would a carbon yeah. filter do the same thing in the room? No. Just what does a carbon filter do? Why Why are the carbon filters even a part of things usually? Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess I it doesn't purify the air. Well, it, okay, so there's different levels to purification. I, I guess I'm just getting at, I was very discouraged for a long time by the amount of things that I had to get exactly right. Yeah. Um, until I finally read something that was just like, dude, just fucking do it. They want to grow. And yes, I'm going to have contamination at some point. I'm going to have to work through some things. And I'm going to run into lessons that are going to make me eventually buy a flow hood. Yeah. But if you're starting the thing out, you know. It's more worth it to just get the knowledge. So both, both, both experiences exist, right? Both experiences exist. So my buddy, who I wouldn't point you towards to, to learn cultivation from, at all, uh, but does a lot of interesting shit all the time because he only has so much stuff at his house. You know what I mean? And so, if you can if you can deal with the fact that there might be failure with something that you're doing, then yes, do that. But if you feel like it, because the same thing could happen, right? Yeah. Well, it's just I'm gonna empower people to just do it in their fucking kitchen and just do it wherever they want, right? And then they fail and then they don't do it anymore. So so because resources are so readily available that the barrier to entry right now is maybe a hundred bucks to do some of this work. I, I would prefer for the right people to start this if they're ready to start this. It would take a little bit of time and like understand some of the dy dynamics of what they're doing so that the longevity of their cultivation career is increased. That's why we teach classes. This is why we do this. This is why you're gonna have a whole live right now in an hour or more that you can go and reference and probably have a whole mic one-on-one -on -one class basically. It's on my profile for free. Do you know what I mean? It is on us. It's on us to do the work. I spent years fucking sifting through forums and all this stuff to then do some of this stuff. You know what I mean? And like, and and did try with the PF Tech first, failed, and got my first grow, and then took my own first medicine, changed my fucking life, and then you know kept working from there. And you meet other people even in my organization that spent two years researching. 
you know, like, you don't have to do that. The whole point is like, watch this video and you can do it right after that. You know what I mean? And we're gonna just show you a lot of the dynamics of doing that. So if you do have a kerosene lamp and you can under, and have a pretty clear, clean space, like just think about like, if there's moving air in, in your house, like turn off the fans, turn off the things that are gonna cause there to be a current so bacteria can land, right? 30 to 45 minutes is usually good for a space to start having air that's settled. children. <laughs> We're going to make sure you come out healthy, but after that, shit's going to get weird. Okay? Like, sorry. You know? But there'll be hugs along the way. There will be some hugs. There will be some yeah, hugs. there'll be some hugs. Yeah, yeah. I'm there for that, for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. So, we have, we have put spores to agar. We have put a, a liquid culture syringe straight into a bag earlier. You know what I mean? If you leave here with a culture syringe, then you have live mycelium that was already tested from a liquid culture on agar. You know it's clean, because I'm giving it to you. Well, I'm gonna say that with the same sort of like understanding that we all need to have is that it's as clean as I, I knew it to be. Okay, if, it's, if, if it ends up contaminating, there's still a litany of factors that go into why that might be the case. You know what I mean? But that's why like as cultivators or even as people come moving in this industry, we're always doing the best we can until we know better. And, and that's what we're here to learn about, right? So um, so we're gonna have a bag that's gonna turn into that bag over there. We've done a couple cultures, culture transfers, and um, then and then what's what's next? I mean what's what what do you guys think? Like we have mycelium growing in different ways. What do you feel like is next after this? I'm sure. Substrate, putting some stuff together. Yeah. Because we want mushrooms, right? Yeah. We actually, so I apologize about this. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can't. Because I want to show you guys later. Uh, you don't get to take the tub home, but you might be able to help put it together. Um, so <laughs> I had to think, I had to think. I'm getting better, getting better about this like energy exchange thing. You know what I mean? Um, and so we're going to move into this next stage here of having space to do some of this. Oh. And I want you guys to know too is that like if you didn't get a chance to do a transfer, it didn't have to happen then. You know, we're gonna move into this next stage and we can also cover some of the other dynamics maybe that we didn't, but this is now a flow head that exists in this space and we can do mycology work as we do. So it's for anybody to use, and I can be here to guide that. Um, okay, amazing. So I have this tub here. Come on, guys. Did you have my first time? It's all about That's presentation. Right. That's right. All about presentation. It's okay, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is, this is, I'm not a product guy, but other people are product people, and they, they saw what I was doing, and I have now business partners, um, I'm actually flying out to LA soon, uh, to do a master class, and, and some of this stuff, right? Um, but we own Shroom Tubs together, and so this is just one way to sort of like have a modulated system, um, for fresh air exchange. So... Having my experience been, there's some modifications we're even making to the design. So next design is actually gonna have the magnets on the tub. And then the lids are gonna be a little bit bigger. So that so that it stays. However, with that being said, as is, we've been producing big flood. If you've been following shroom tubs or if you've been following Denver Mycology and seen any of it, like they've been working perfectly fine as is. It's just moving forward. I want it to be a little bit more sustainable so that the magnet will just stay on the tub kind of forever. And then you can just replace the patches as you go. So I want to address just what we're looking at right now. Is that like the 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 tub itself, why is it like this? Like what's one reason why we might have like this growing environment for a tub? Retain humidity. Retain humidity. Right? Like you yeah, you're 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 taking something that's been colonized in spawn, which is the spawn media, and um, right here and you're move you're taking this and you're putting it into a new environment and you're going to be mixing it with something else what is that called substrate, substrate. Yeah. often we'll discuss it as bulk substrate they're just different they're all substrates even this right but this is spawn 
this is spawned when my ceiling is growing. Spawn media is actually the, uh, the mylo, uh, the grain, bird seed stuff. Um, this is really nicely colonized. Who wants to do the honors of breaking this up? Hands matter, man. Yeah, I trust you. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta think. You gotta think the most loving thoughts, though. Perfect. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Perfect. So I do smash it. Oh, you can just just you'll figure it out. Massage it. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> you teach yourself. You know what I mean? Like the classes, they always teach themselves. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it going, man. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> For, for back to sex. Uh, <laughs> you never go far. Nah, yeah, you can't. You can't. And then, like, that's a creative energy is sexual energy. Yep. So, I'm getting, it's all about putting your energy into this. I'm, I'm dead energy. serious about that. Yep. You have a mother's day about that. That's right. Yeah, Dia de la Madre. Si. Si, si, si. Yeah, beautiful, brother. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. So, now, for those watching, right, the bag looks different, okay? I have to remember, there's multiple audiences, right, as there always is. And so, the bag looks different, you know? You're like, oh my god, like, where did all the mycelium go? Fuck, I gotta let it colonize again. Yeah, it's perfect. This has been colonizing since 4-3, so it's over a month. Pretty confident. You felt it, it felt pretty solid when you are doing it. Yeah, so, so what you're actually seeing is that the mycelium has probably touched almost everything in here. Even, let's just pretend that there's one of them in here that didn't get any mycelium at all. You know, didn't get to hang out with its new homie. The, you're kind of looking at like a, this bulk appeal of, of like all their homies protecting that though. You know, so you kind of can be at least somewhat confident that what you're going to put in there is something that, um, is something that's going to take care of maybe something that didn't get fully colonized. You know, and so, and then we learn, we learn, you know, you might be like, oh, you know what, maybe I need to let that one colonize a little bit longer. And usually, yeah. Is, is there a downside to letting it uh, recolonize after breaking it up at no, all? Not really. Is there an advantage? Um, you, so, so we just had some very experienced cultivators. I really respect their opinion um, from like having to do this at scale, serious scale. And they would say no. They, they would just say maybe, but like at the end of the day, uh, it hasn't seemed to be a percolating factor that is making a big difference, right? So the, the answer to that question still may exist. That it's, it may be better, right? But at scale, and, and when you're doing a cultivation practice, usually you're going to find that cultivators find the through line. Like they just will because you're always looking to make this more, more efficient and, and go well, right? So... Um, so yeah, so you know, letting it recolonize the idea around that might be is that like, oh, okay, so the things that didn't get colonized might then, you know? I also though build off of momentum though. I kind of like also feed that. If I see that it's colonizing really fast, then I may break it up the night before, you know? And then it's like still slightly broken and it's like trying to make those connections again and then I put it in. You know what I mean? Like that's the that's like the what I would do that would sort of meet you in the middle. With that, where I'll just break it up the night before, know how many tubs I'm going to be doing the next day, and then um, deal with them however they are, because they're gonna they're not going to be fully colonized, but they will be like trying to grow again. You know. Have you ever colonized where like it gets to like about ninety five percent, and then it seems like there's just a little tiny top layer that like didn't get it? Would you just let that ride for a little longer, or is that like a bad sign that maybe there's a contaminant? Both. Break it up, see what happens, right? But yes, I mean, if it was growing really, really fast and it got to one like part one and it just won't yeah. colonize that, then you're then and it doesn't look like it's sporulating stuff. So it could be bacterial. You know, those are those signs. It's like, well, you know, mold makes spores. You know, often like different molds, but if it's not making any colors, but 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 it looks like splotchy and then it's not growing fast. Probably bacteria. That's like where you can be at when you're first starting this. And then you can get into verification methods that utilize like microscopes and everything. You know what I mean? And so now we are at a place where we have the bag broken up. 
And then, uh, yeah, yeah, so these are some liners that we're starting to work with. Um, they're not pre-cut for the tubs yet. That'd be too easy. We'll one, day, one day. We'll get there. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm even, uh, <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not a white brand in like somehow. Uh, but really thin silicone, you know, like in, in working with different types of materials so that if you do want to grow in a tub, which is other ways to grow, like you can just fruit out of a bag, you can fruit out of a lot of things. I want you to use the same basic principles, right? You're just trying to put it in something that's going to retain a lot of the humidity, you know, so that during the colonization phase, it is uh, allowing for the CO2 to build up. You know, it's, it, which is inherent in what it's gonna do, you know, because it's, it's building mycelium. And then when it, when it needs to fruit, it needs oxygen, just like we do. It respirates, you know? So, uh, so you're just trying to keep it in something where the humidity is gonna stay close to 100% and allow for the CO2 to build up too. Having some headroom in this is like seems to be helpful. Like having really thick substrate. Another question you might ask: Well, how how thick should the substrate be? I've been in a place and seen it firsthand where they're trying to use those kitchen tubs, the bus tubs, and filling it all the way to the top. That's like eight to ten inches of substrate. Think about the gradient. Think about the gradient, the environment all the way through that. Do you think it's uniform? Do you know what I mean? Like, no, like what you're trying to do is like give, you don't want anaerobic down here, anaerobic up there. They're, they they will cultivate different things. They can even like cultivate different contaminants. You're gonna allow, at eight inches down, you're gonna start getting into anaerobic, almost no matter what, you know? Like, it doesn't mean that it won't work. Some mushrooms will work really well with that because they grow fast. But like for cubes, um, with cubes, doing eight inches of substrate is not really, it's definitely not industry standard, and it also seems to present other challenges. So four inches, three to five inches even. Three to five inches, I've seen people do, you know, like four inches is like, is like this, I think. Yeah, so you know, like four inches is probably the max that we go, and usually it'll sit, I think my holes are cut around three inches. You know what I mean? And so like that's, I usually do it on three inches, and I usually will only go two or three flushes of those even if it keeps going, because you're, you're inviting in contamination as it goes. So when you're trying to move fast, and you're trying to do this at scale, you just want to see what is the minimum quantity of mushrooms that I want to get out of out of this, you know? Like, what's my consistency? Oh, I've already gotten eight ounces? Okay, cool, let's put it in a compost pile, let's let that maybe even do an outdoor patch and then move on, because when you're bringing in more and more contamination into your cultivation environment, then you're gonna start dealing with problems down the road or even, not even too far down the road, the next day. <laughs> the road is, you know, what it is. Um, Colorado roads. Colorado roads. <laughs> aren't always that great. Um, so, this has holes. This isn't the product how it would be. This is kind of like something we're experimenting with. Um, and this is kind of how you might do this. And so what we might also, um, you know what we might do with this? Because what I was planning on doing with some of these is just letting the plastic kind of fall over on it. It might be an added layer to just keep the humidity in um, and then see how that goes. So if you've seen like the trash bag tech, you can just take a whole trash bag, cut it down the side, and then lean the trash bag over the top of the, the, the substrate and then let it colonize in there, you know? And so something that we were moving towards just because I'm working on having these a little bit more sealed is doing that. So we're not even gonna we're not even gonna um, cut this liner here. We're gonna just leave it as is. Um, and why the holes in the bottom? They're not. It's, no, they're it's not. just okay. it's just a sample product that we're getting. Mm -hmm. It's more about the material okay. that we're that we're starting to experiment with because it's a biodegradable and, and compost. Mm -hmm. You don't need it to be. I don't know if you're trying to get clear. Like, okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. That's a really good answer. Uh, really good answer. A uh, question and uh, light is like almost a secondary or tertiary factor for most of this. You know, it is an influencing factor for mushrooms to grow, just like it is for you. But you could also live in a cave for a while and probably do just fine, right? And so, like, you get a little weird. Again, things get weird. So do the mushrooms. Um, so, so light. No, uh, pinning side pins and stuff like that. The reason why we might be doing a liner is so that it it 
so that the, there isn't a micro environment created around mm -hmm. around how it's growing. You don't want that. So when the subject no, uh, it's shrinks, it's right? really about logistics, man. I mean, it's a, it's for me, it's energy conservation. Right. So I'm forcing the the mushrooms to grow in a certain area, because like because if the plastics on the sides, it can't grow there. But if it starts to shrink, right? So like what happens is, is we're gonna put the my, the the bag in there along with the substrate. And then that's gonna all mix together and it's gonna be completely full, right? It's gonna like fill out the whole thing. But then as the mycelium grows, it starts uh, util using that water that's in there to grow. And then it also starts making a network of all these little high flow strands are bringing the substrate together. And so it makes it into this like really strong cake is what you'll hear it called sometimes. Um, and then it also can, starts to come away from the sides which then opens up a microenvironment all the way around the tub too, where then mushrooms are like, oh, dope. And it's actually one of the best environments in some ways. Like the mushrooms will really want to grow it because it's really humid. And then it's really slow air exchange too, which is where the CO2 and the oxygen are starting to mix and change when you go into the food environment. So, so that exterior pinning is actually really great. It's just that it makes it also really difficult because you start having mushrooms growing up off the bottom. Oh, yeah. And then you're trying to get them out it, you know, so it's more of a logistical thing. Yeah. And something that I will also invite you to think about is that the next stage of this is that maybe you do abandon the liner after the first flush. And I have other cultivators who will then raise it up because it's already like a- uh, Solid enough. It's already solid enough. And it's already smaller than the tub itself. And then they'll put in like a couple quart jars and like a, a, a little screen or whatever and, and put it on that. And then the mushrooms will grow up all, all over it. The substrate, but it's just like you can't really do that for the first flush, right? But you could do that for the second or third flush, and that really has a lot more to do with how much time you're putting into this and how much experimenting. You know, I'm teaching you the basics so you can make decisions on how you cultivate. Um, I am never going to be a person that will tell you this is the way to do it because I don't believe that. Um, I don't believe life works that way, actually. So, um, so this is one way to do it. And uh, we're going to clean this the best we can. Do you have a charger? I have a charger. <laughs> what kind of phone? Android? iPhone. iPhone? iPhone. Otherwise, if this turns off, will it save it to you? Nope. Is it, how, how close is my phone? Is close it? enough that you should probably save it. Let me see real quick. <laughs> okay, it's getting there. If we can find okay. a charger grid, we'll give it a couple more minutes though. Cool. Yeah, because I want to at least, if we can show Just wanted to make you aware. It'd be great to have the whole thing on. So then that just gives us a timeline a little bit. Oh, we would need a cord still. Yeah. Um, that's okay. That's okay. This is something that I kind of need to demonstrate anyways. So I shouldn't be worried about having too much alcohol in the tub because it feels like... We're, I'm letting it, I'm letting okay. it air out. Okay. By the time I'm doing this, I'm thinking about the amount of time that I'm going to be taking to do this. Uh, and then that alcohol is going to evaporate. Okay. It's going to evaporate in the first 10 minutes. Okay. You know what you need? Stay, right? What? In order to be uh, sterile or clean, that alcohol actually has to get to let it evaporate, right? It's well, wet, it's gonna... well, no, wet, wet is the water, right? So if you're using 30% alcohol, uh, what is Everclear? As soon as you're putting it on, it's like going away, right? And then you're left with the water, the alcohol evaporates. Um, okay. Is you do. Yeah. Holy crap. Mom to the rescue. <laughs> Mom on Mother's Day. That's good. It's your day. I knew I needed one here. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing a service. <laughs> Do the Lord's work. Keep it go. It's my whole job. <laughs> Does anyone want to do me a favor and give me water? Just fill this up. Thanks, Lou. Yeah, I got you. Oh. Is that working? I have a note too. If you got it out of that. Yeah. No problem at all. Is that working? I don't think so. Yeah.
the, the cord is the cord is long enough, so um, the cord is long. Of course, of course, she has like a five foot cord or whatever this is. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we'll just plug it in. Awesome, 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 awesome. Um, I just want you to tell me. This is two gifts, right? The first one, if you can tell me what bulk substrate this is, you get the gift. <laughs> Manure. Honestly, yeah. like if you, yeah. I don't think so. There, it's the other way. So it would have worked with the battery too. You're good. Plug it back in. It's the see. It's only one way. Oh. The connector has to be fucking in. Apple. Hey man, I got a degree the in science for a fucking reason. Right. Where'd you go to school? Arizona State. Um, awesome. So we're going to put this together the way that, like, I, I'm going to show you what the Coyer looks like and everything, but this was, it, like, listen, like, this is such a gift. Like, what we can do right now and why we're doing it, we have cultivators in this room that brought us this stuff. Uh, but this is their hard work. This is their hard work. This is uh, TK King's hard work. This is their hard, very hard work to have something that's gonna grow really well. And we're gonna be doing it here and also like following up. You know, if you wanna follow and see how this stuff grows, that's what we're gonna do too, you know what I mean? So um, I'm gonna put on... Do you prefer manure over cocoa? It's not about preference. It's not about preference. Or what works better. Yeah, and it's what you wanna work with. Sure. You know what I mean? So if you ask, if you ask, um, them, you know, it's it's what you have access to. So, the you're usually gonna get bigger, like pretty fucking potent mushrooms off of manure. Like manure is they're dung loving for a reason, right? Like uh, first mushrooms I ever picked in the wild were in Australia off of compounds, straight up. Um, and uh, and they're they're the across my world. So. Um, so this is a good way to do it, but there's a leaching process, right? Like if you get manure, then usually you're gonna like run water through it, let it dry, run water through it, let it dry, run water through it, let it dry. That's a leaching process. Because you're trying to get things like excess ammonia, like all these other things that might be in it, out, and allowing for that water to be that like sort of distillation process to something that is gonna be more conducive for mycelium growth. Could you say the name of the... TKK King, or TKK King. I think it's TKK K, the King something. Has that been an yet? No, this is a bulk substrate. It's just two Ks. Oh, that's two Ks. Ks. TK King. Oh. Texas Cubensis King. Yeah. Yeah. 2.0. All right. He's dope. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is. This is like pasteurization, right? You know what I mean? So what is? We're now we're at the level of what is pasteurization and what is sterilization. Yeah. Cool, we we got here. I knew we would. I knew we would at some point. Sterilization is one seventy five. Negative. Sterilization. Kinda, but but not not what we're not. Yeah, partial sterilization can start happening at one seventy five. I'm not like from a temperature standpoint, yes, but actually when we're usually working at fifteen psi, what's the temperature? No. Close. No. Maybe really close. 47. Even closer. <laughs> 250. 250. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're always going to get like the answer. It's just how long, right? How long does it take for us to find an answer, right? So, um, so pasteurization generally, for most people, will happen between 160 and 170. Between 160 and 170. And you're doing pasteurization minimum. You want this at that temperature for an hour and a half. No. An hour and a half. Two hours. It can be at that temperature for eight hours. I mean, you know what I mean? Because like, if you're doing the bucket tuck, 
for a cooler tech even. It's not, it is a cooler tech in some ways, but you're also doing it in a cooler. Mm -hmm. um, then you have an insulated container, so you have to think about that, right? Like you go from doing the bucket tech, which is in a uh, five gallon Home Depot bucket. Have you heard of that? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't you've heard of that, some of us haven't. So a bucket tech would just be like taking a coir or your, sub, your bulk substrate, pouring boiling water in it, yeah. straight from the stove. Mm -hmm. You've already count, you've already like know how much water you're putting in it. And we'll get to field capacity also here in a minute. Um, and then you just cap it and you just let it sit. So when you say eight hours, well, yeah, you kind of have to like set it and get it tomorrow. When do you want to put mushrooms in a bulk substrate? Like at what temperature? Under 80. What? Under, I don't know, under, I wait for it to be at least like down room temperature. Like what yeah. Back to the human thing, right? You know what I mean? Like, what, you know, what, what's comfortable for it. you? Try not to shock it. You know, you're not trying to like, if you're trying to grow mycelium in higher temperatures, you know, that's the way you want to think, right? Well, if I put really hot water or put it into really hot substrate, then I'm also going to select from mycelium that grows more at that temperature. Or select it for mycelium that is resilient to that type of stress. You put a probe in the bucket. There are like wireless thermometers. You can put a probe. You can do all that. Yeah. No. The, the bucket tank inherently is a bucket tank because you're not for boiling water. That's that's this is where go get some coca coir, which is just coconut pith, it's the stuff off the shells and stuff, you know? Um, and then put it in a bucket with boiling water and you have the bulk substrate. If you've gotten from the level of having the like grain bag given to you or something, and then a syringe, and you got it to the level of having, you know, myceliated spawn, media, I have to try to use all my terms properly. Um, then all you're gonna do is get ready to pasteurize the thing that's gonna go in, make sure that it has enough water. I wanna address though, pasteurization and sterilization. Pasteurization is gonna happen at a temperature that we're talking about between 160 and 170, usually like 165 is something people will choose. So you want it to be there for at least an hour and a half, two hours, um, and can be longer. But you try not to go higher than those temperatures and you start getting into partial sterilization. So it's a really important conversation, guys. This is like right, you're right at the right at the gate, right? Like you don't want to fuck it up, okay? So, so if you get into partial sterilization, then depending on how fast your mushroom, your mycelium is going to grow, you might have substrate that's partially sterilized that is also inviting other things to grow on it because it's like cleaner. It's so clean that anything can grow on it. Pasteurization means that you're only allowing for the things that are growing at 165 or lower. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's still stay it's growing, growing, you know what I mean? Or, or higher, like, in, in, you know, I guess like other things, like anything above 165 will still be there. That, that could be there, right? You know, so you're not trying to eliminate all those things. You're letting it stay because you know that some microbial community is good. Because they know how to figure it out. They're like, okay, cool, like we, we got all those guys, sorry, I said backwards, all the guys from 165 down out and all the guys from 165 up they're good, they're ready to go, right? And so that allows us to be actually a little bit more resilient to everything else. And then also when you're putting the mycelium into this, uh, then you're also giving it the best chance. So you're not sterilizing this, you're pasteurizing. When you're sterilizing the media at the beginning, um, depending on whether you're doing, it kind of gets elongated, but if you're doing liquid culture, how long do we sterilize liquid culture a liquid media, a, just liquid. 30 minutes? No. 25? You know? You do 45? Yeah. Cool. So, so 45, you're going to probably start getting into criminalization. Does that matter? It doesn't seem to. You know? Because um, you're putting sugar in this. And so, actually, the, the scientific, I'm pretty sure it's 25 minutes at 15 psi, which is 250 degrees. You know, I think you can actually go all the way down to 15 minutes. Um, and I would look at this, you know what I mean? This is for a liquid. This is something that's like immediately going to be able to you know, like have all of the 
have all the heat, right? It retains all the heat. There's a little, there's a little letter called C, it's the heat capacity of an object. So the heat capacity of an object is gonna dictate how long it's usually gonna need to sterilize. Water immediately absorbs the heat. So that's why you can do it at, for 25 minutes at 15 PSI and it's sterile. That's at 250 degrees, right? You want every single piece of this grain in here sterile, right? You want every single piece of this grain to be sterilized for 25 minutes at 15 PSI. But to do that, you'll usually have it in there for two hours. Depending on elevation, that could change too, right? Mm -hmm. If you live at elevation, you might do it a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Or higher temp. Or higher temp, you know, which is, which is the same thing, you know? So like, so with the pressure cookers, uh, they have a rocker, and they'll go above 15 PSI. It's just they'll be letting out steam even faster because what you're working is fluid dynamics propulsion is taking steam and then that cap on top of it is a, is weighted in a certain way that it will float when it gets to a certain temperature you know with a certain amount of upward thrust from that steam right cool okay so it's so important to do this because like I realized too like when we we're doing some of these classes that like people were afraid of the pressure cooker you know what I mean? Like, I fucking get that. Where's the pressure cooker at? Where's the lid? Where's the thingy? I didn't use it for like two weeks after I bought it because I was like, What's in here? Uh, just a warm pressure cooker. Oh. <laughs> 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 Alright, so we're going to do a little exercise. Is this a joke? It's sterile. It's, it's sterile water. water. We brought it, so just in case. So it's good to have like distilled water with you when you're starting to do the bulk substrate stuff because if you notice that for whatever reason your bulk substrate just is like too dry, then you can add some distilled water at that stage to like help it out and make sure that you have enough water, enough hydration for your mycelium to grow in. Um, so this is a Presto, this is a 23 quart pressure cooker. There was a day where these were $80, and then there was also a day where they were $400. Those days existed in this last year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, <laughs> I think we all know that, man. Yeah, exactly. And then the All-Americans started at 600 and then they went up to fucking God knows what, you know? Like 1500 two grand, I saw on some of them, you know? So uh, there was a big market for pressure cookers for a while. That's chilled down. I would say that there's some industrial things you could probably get into from an industrial standpoint. Um, and if you're interested in, in that, then we can talk too. But like, uh, other than that, this is what you would be using, potentially, as the first thing that you would do to sterilize things. And you might ask, can I use my Instant Pot? Well, that usually gets up to 11 PSI. Uh, <laughs> I got into this really funny debate. I'll call it a debate. It seemed like an Instagram, but it's the first one in my life. With the psilocybin mushroom Bible. Mm. What's up, guys? Um, Here's the thing about all this stuff, is that from their evidence and from what they were doing, they were able to show that you could use an Instant Pot and do the PF Tech fine. So I would go with that. They had the evidence to do so. But from a scientific standpoint, um, it's, it may not be full sterilization. You know what I mean? And so, so, and that's obviously not what we're dealing with either though, right? Like, this is what we're kind of highlighting, is that it doesn't even need to be fully sterile. You just have to have something that wants to grow in it more than the other things that are in it. And hopefully that's your mycelium. Right? So uh, so yes, yeah, so now we're there. We are right here. I took a little bit longer since the phone had a place to charge. <laughs> um, amazing, amazing, beautiful. Do you do any sort of cleaning to the pressure cooker after so many uses? Cleaning like the pressure sort of cooker. Like, uh, maintenance to it. Maintaining the pressure. You know what? Uh, no. <laughs> I really want to tell you that I like do all the rules and I do all that stuff, but like, I think you're supposed to oil the, <laughs> yeah, the, the gasket every time and stuff. Ask, ask how many cultivators do you have. Like, okay? just be real here. You know? But have like, a spare gasket. Have a spare. So yeah, this is what she brings up. I have spare parts for all the all Americans because they're really fucking cheap. Like. I even broke a gauge. You know how you break a gauge? You, you like drop the lid. You know what I mean? Like that's what happens. Like so, I didn't think I could do that, and then I did it. You know, and once you start buying spare parts for your pressure cooker too, you might actually notice how easy it is to make your own. Because now you have a gauge, you have a rocker that's engineered to do that. You can even get the nipple. Not this one. It's a different type of nipple. Um, different type of nipple. 
than the one you have on your body. But uh, but you can get that too for that, and you can make your own things. You know what I mean? Like they make all the extra parts. They're the ones that just cast the big pressure cookers in aluminum and stuff. You know? So. Um, Wow, the mouth gets dry. Whew. Okay, cool. So, so what we're putting our trust in here is uh, our fellow cultivators' um, mycelium. You know, we're, I'm putting my trust right now in the fact that I know this is going to grow really fast, and I know that it's going to take hold. And I also know that with TKK's. Uh, uh, substrate, which is really, really fine-tuned at this point, um, that this is going to be a really good environment for this mycelium to go, even doing it in an open air area, without a tent or anything like that. You might be like, well, Chris, maybe you want to do it in front of the flow head. Well, it introduces actually other issues, because it's like, it's kind of hard to get the whole thing in front of it, and then there's going to be turbulent air, and I have to get in front of it and stuff. It's just like, I, I don't know. I actually think that this might be better just to do it as is. I've done it in my kitchen. Uh, for many years, um, so and in my closet. So, when you have good mycelium, that's what's going to happen. Um, you want to get in a little bit closer, Andy? Or yeah, you're going to yeah. put it on that chair. Yeah, I think we're going to do it here. Yeah, do it. Okay, I don't have. Have your mask. Hey, mask. Beautiful. Okay, so this is the one thing, just because I have to talk to you guys, and like I'm this right, like I'm taking a moment, even though I'm teaching and I'm dropping into cultivation. Usually, this is something that I'm going to be doing peacefully, not talking actually, like maybe even with headphones or music on, and just like settle into it. I'm about to be putting substrate together, and I might move fast if I'm going to be doing a lot, but I'm going to be methodical, and I'm going to like really get into it, and just like you get really sweaty, uh, putting together ten or more tubs at a time. I'm telling you right now, you'll get an idea. Of, do you want to be running a hundred tubs? <laughs> do you? Is that what you want? You know what I mean? Like, like you may want that from a financial standpoint, but recognize that there's work involved, yeah. and there's going to be failure involved too. I've met a lot of cannabis cultivators who want to scale fast. And I'm like, I'm so happy you're talking to me. <laughs> That's all, you know? I just want you to be successful and realistic with how many people you might need to help with or how you need to like adjust yourself to do this, you know? So we're gonna just get this in here. I'm gonna kind of like uh, move all this. I would generally probably take all this stuff off too, but it's kind of, um, I test, I test everything, right? I don't really need to do this. Like a lot of people, uh, if David Gonzalez is on here, Michael Blast, like a lot of people do it with just their hands. You know, I do want to give this the best chance. So I have gloves on and we're going to move into a space where I have scissors. Amazing. <laughs> space exists. Um, I'm going to... Is that just a breathing port on there? Yeah, so this is this is just a port that they're using to, so that this doesn't become anaerobic. If you seal this completely and you ship it out to people and they just let it sit for a while, it's not that it can't work. Like even for me with like a cocoa coir, I'll zip tie it up in a turkey bag. But I like I suggest you to use it within this week or so. You know what I mean, or as soon as possible, because otherwise you might start developing some anaerobic issues. I've also noticed that I've had like bags of cocoa coir, especially coir, I can't talk about this, coir though, that are in a turkey bag for like a month and then I use it in a tub and it works just fine. But you have to recognize is that like coir, there's not a lot of stuff that's gonna grow on it. And if you're pairing it with really fast growing mycelium, then it's a good mix. Even if there was something in it. Which there is, because it's only pasteurized, right? So, um, so there's two things that are gonna happen here. I'm going to pull this out. I'm going to uh, cut this. Smell it. Do you have to pasteurize 
charger? Did it come ready to go just like that? Or have you done anything to it before today? This is TKK's product. But it's like straight from him, you haven't done anything yes. to it? Okay. Yeah, this is his product. This indeed pasteurized stuff, especially with the airport can say did for a few weeks. Really. Quite a bit, yeah. I mean, yeah, they, they, they take care of all that. Yeah. Woo. So I want to give you guys, uh, this is like, it's pretty good. Okay. Ideal, especially here, it's dry as hell. So like yeah. your, your field capacity test needs to deal with the environment. Wow. This is the best smelling substrate I've ever smelled. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Doing something right. Um, can you guys actually open, can you take those scissors and open the bag? Do you see what I'm doing here? Like, I've just touched all this. I don't really want to like start touching other things, especially with manure yeah, why not? on my hands. And, um, oh, I got itch. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, okay. pour it in there. Now we're gonna pour this in here. I'm gonna try it once you back out. You guys do like a two to one ratio of spawn and substrate pretty much? Yeah, you're good. Give or take. You know, with yeah. this, like these, uh, these little like Milo kernels just like get in there, you know? Oh, yeah. So it's like, this is a, probably a little bit more substrate than I would even put in my own tubs. Um, cause I think those bags are maybe five or six pounds, yeah, but, that's pretty big. uh, was a tub design for like three. Yeah. Three or four. You know what I mean? But, uh, because we have access to this and I know that it's like going to work, we're going to do this. It's also what's good about having this liner because now it's like going to get into the patches and stuff and I'm just going to lean it over once I get this all mixed up, right? You don't find that like puddles of moisture seem to build up when the flaps of the liner are covering it? Like it kind of like allows for like a little cool to... Well, um, yeah, but... That doesn't matter too much. Yeah, we can talk about that in a second. Can you um, pull my nose thing up? Gotcha. <laughs> Thank you. Just trying to get it done because of that tub. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're going to see me pop into cultivator mode a little bit more right now because there's like a time, there's just like stuff that needs to happen here, you know? All right. And then we can talk about it kind of after. Feel free to stand up, just don't put your head, head over it. If you want to get a closer look, you can, because we're right at the stage now where I feel like I'm not pressing it, I'm not like compacting it, but I'm kind of like compressing it together, right? And for this, I think this works out really perfect, especially with our what experiment we're going to be doing with this, is then we're just laying this over. And I'm even going to like, like pull on it a little bit. And this is a, you say this is something you normally you're just kind of experimenting? Well, no, I mean, I've done this in the year, year, years past, but especially with these, um, with these new liners. Okay, okay. Just because it's like, usually we might have them like specially cut or you can just like, I don't always do this as far as like covering up the substrate because we have an environment that stays pretty humid and they grow just fine. It's really convention. It's down to convention. Um, if we can get the lid, Yeah, give me one second. I, I, you know, I know that you guys have been here in the States for a while. Um, I was just in a place where masks did not exist, and they still kind of bother me. 
Um, okay, so um, yeah, so all this is kind of closed up. And we're good. We just put the whole, we put a whole tub together. We just went through the whole, basically the whole cultivation process. The only couple of things that you didn't fully see is like how to hydrate the grain. And that's stuff that we can even talk about at this point too. Um, and we're going to, we want to find a place even like trash wise or if we have something. Um, for that shit bag? For our shit bag. <laughs> uh, I, had a, I had a question. What do you use in your local cultures for them to be on? So I actually just started something new. I don't know if you guys end up watching this, but it's uh, sorghum syrup. Sorghum syrup? Yeah, take it down, take it down, take it down. Sorghum syrup. No training. Uh, S o r g h u m. More the molasses. Sorghum syrup. Sorghum. So what is it made from? Sorghum. Some kind of sugar, right? That's what short sorghum is. A, is actually one of the major uh, major grains that you in in the cot. Um, so anything. Sorry, this is what I mean. It's a different experience like for me, like doing that and then coming back is a little bit. So uh, gourmets and medicinals will use sorghum a lot. So sorghum is like a, is like a millet or milo almost. It's just bigger though. Okay. Yeah. So sorghum syrup at uh, the suggested, depending on it's like between, this is going to be true for, for most sugars, anything. Tablespoon is sort of the base. And then double it if you want more, if you want more. <laughs> you know, like, think about it. Mycelium can basically grow just in water, like in water agar, if you've right. ever heard of that, right? So that's your base. Nothing. So, okay, add you one put gram. too much sugar add, in there? Yes, because okay. it becomes, what does it become then? Toxic? Yeah, yeah, but what's another word that we use really commonly in this? Preservative. Yeah, you're making preserves, oh, sure. that's, oh, right? That's jam, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you Mother's Day is a good day, right? That's like you use sugar as a preservative. You can use salt as a preservative. You can use vinegar. You can use anything that's going to alter the pH in a certain way as a preservative. Why? Because it eliminates the growth of a lot of other things. Why did you choose to switch to that? Uh, because I have some great friends that are yeah, really great cultivators, and this better. is how I work with yeah. my kids. Yeah. You know, it's like I've been doing things over the years, and then someone will give it, they're like, hey man, like I've been working with this for a while, I'm great, I'll change my right up and do a few jars that way, you know, for liquid culture, and you can do the same thing for agar. What, like, this is a cool place to be, right? So it's like, uh, now we're getting into the dynamics. You just got to see, this is gonna grow mushrooms. I would put, I would put 95% chance that it's gonna grow mushrooms. 5% just because I'm not God. <laughs> That's all. You know what I mean? I'm pretty confident, you know? Like, it feels good. It feels really good. It felt good. Um, and the substrate was, like, at the right right hydration, you know? Um, really healthy mycelium. I know where I got it from. All right, so for liquid culture and agar, how do we make it? Who knows one recipe? Recipes for agar? Yeah, just, uh, yeah. What's a recipe for agar? Uh, do you mean different things you could put in it as nutrients? Or do you mean actual like recipe numbers? 500 milliliters <laughs> of water, 10 grams of uh, sugar, and 10 grams of uh, agar. Yeah. Perfect. That is exactly right. Yeah, I mean, that's basically it. You can do, you can do a variation. Of, of any of that. And so when we teach in my class, we just have a whole bunch of different flowers, and people can use the flower, a little bit of dextrose, and the agar. And so you're using like per liter, I usually work off of liters, so when you said it, the ratios were exactly the same, right? I would use 18 to 20 grams of agar for a liter. A tablespoon, tablespoon. You know, it's like it, you can do, you can kind of add anything to it uh, and see what, it, see what it grows on it. So, but a good tech is like, uh, you could just do even agar with dextrose in it if you wanted, you know what I mean? But usually you want to add a little bit more starch or a little bit more nutrients to give it, so that's why you might add a flour. It's a little bit more complex for it to break down. Like a flour, mm -hmm. F-O-U-R, oh, 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 oh. flour. Sorry, like a, like a potato flour. Okay, got it. Or, you know, but usually with like, um, Oh, something I was going to tell you guys. I was going to make available my whole my workbook for the Cosmic Cultivators program for you. Okay, so like you can it has recipes and all that type of stuff in it as PDF. 
if you send me your email address on Denver Mycology for Instagram, it's not for me to promote myself, it's literally the only way I communicate with people. So it's, if you want it, I can send it to you and I can make available, I can give you permissions for the Google Drive folder where some of that stuff's in. All right, like this is the fastest we've ever done a Cosmic Cultivators class. <laughs> Usually this is like something you like come for the first day and you're super overwhelmed. The next day you realize why you're there because you're like, oh, it's like about the people and we're, and we're just learning cultivation as we go. And by the third day you don't want to leave and no one's leaving my house and it's just like, okay, great. And then the fourth day we're in ceremony and they're like, oh my God, this is really why I came here, right? So we don't get to do the ceremony part. Some of you might, I mean, give you a chocolate bar, so have your own yeah. ceremony. Uh, <laughs> let me know how that goes. Um, and, uh, and then other than that, um, you really are like, you, you know, you're gonna have opportunities. After this, to use the flow hood. If you want to do some culturing, I'm gonna be right here. Uh, I'm gonna be right here to help, or Trey will be, or Andy will be. There's probably a lot of other successful cultivators here that can help with that as well. Um, and you can take a plate home with you. You know what I mean? You can have something to, to grow some mushrooms from. Um, so the liquid culture in agar, let's get to the bottom of that real quick. So liquid culture, if you're gonna make it with sorghum syrup, uh, 15 to 30 grams per liter, you know? And when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're, bless you, thank you, bless you. Um, when you're navigating like how to like move forward using agar and liquid culture is just by like understanding how much you put in and tracking it. I, I'm not I'm not shoving it down your throat right now like track everything you do, but with this type of stuff it does help because like then you can know like oh well I only put ten grams in that whole liter and then my psyllium is growing really fast still. I'm gonna do five more grams. I'm gonna do five grams next time. Cause like part of it you want you don't wanna like over put too many nutrients in the media that it's growing in because you kind of want to select for the mycelium that's going to grow on like a reasonable amount of nutrients. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Like, so that's one idea, that's selection idea. And then the second is so that you can also see phenotypically that you'll actually see the strands, the mycelium, the actual hypo strands are growing faster than the others. So that's why you might adjust the amount of nutrients you use in these different medias. Would you say all different um, types of mycelium grow, should grow in that same like structural shape or not necessarily? No, not at all. I mean, look at lion's mane. Lion's mane looks like it's, it's, you, it's like what's rhizomorphic for lion, like it's not, it's like sometimes really fluff, fluffy and even when it's colonizing bags and stuff, you're like, is it really fully colonized? I'm like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so all types of mushrooms have their different personality in mycelium, even in cubes. I'll notice that I was like, oh, I was cultivating ape, and then we kind of did the hybrid test. We, that's maybe another conversation we can have too around hybridization and genetic breeding, um, which might be good to follow up on some of this, but I do want to circle back around the mental model that we have around cultivation, where you're at with that, and, and how you're dealing with the understanding of doing this at your own house. How's that sound? Okay, so we're gonna work through this again from the top to the bottom. Top to the bottom. All right, so. Um, what is this thing? What, real quick, what's going on in this jar over here on the... I knew there was something wrong. What? Yeah. Sorry. What, what jar? The, the LC. That, that one? On, on the magnetic stir. What's going on in that? Yeah. What do you think's going on in that? I don't know if I know. I know. <laughs> but what do you, like, what do you think would, would be going on? It looks like maybe a... Especially an early liquid culture. Trey? Well, like, it would be very dark to that, I guess. Well, it's, the I darkness... Really, I haven't used the sorghum syrup, so The know. darkness is a little bit more from the sorghum syrup, like, slightly caramelizing during, um, during, uh, sterilization. So, so the coloring of it is related to the sugar and how it made its way through the sterilization process. And that has probably a lot of living mycelium in it, right? That's a pretty healthy yeah. one. Yeah. Is that old? Is that one that we've been using? Uh, I haven't used it yet. Okay. So it's just that the sugar like caramelized pretty much in there. Yeah. It's the color. There's yes. No, and there's no issue there. No. Okay. The problem, the thing that I like, I'm using this because I know it works well and I'm trusting it from other people. I really like clear though. 
Like, right. if I had to choose, I would choose something like this. So, it's this just that is that clear. Right? This might just be dextrose. What do you, what's in here? Just dextrose? Malt. And what? Malt. Oh, malt. Yeah, MBA. Yeah, so it's like, it's without the agar, but it's like malt. You can do a little bit of light malt, LME. I use Cairo. Yeah. What is it? Cairo. Cairo? Uh, Corn syrup. Cairo. Oh, Cairo. Yeah. Ah, we're back. We're back to high school now. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cairo syrup is the, is the, it's just sugar syrup. What do you think about using grape water? Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea. That's why we're using sorghum syrup. I'm using sorghum syrup because it's basically grape water. Because where did it come from? Sorghum, right? So, so that's like a refined way to just get syrup, and I don't have to keep storing all the grain water. You know, like the problem with storing grain water is then you like have so much of it, and you have to make sure to sterilize it right after, otherwise a lot of shit starts growing. In. You know what I mean? So uh, I did that for a little bit, and then was like kind of tired of like storing all my grain water. But what I would suggest is if you want to do that, then uh, when you make your grain and you're pouring that water off, just uh, pour it into like another bucket and then have some jars ready to go to sterilize all that. And then you can have your grain water ready for any liquid culture in the future. But the concentration is important. You don't want it to be too concentrated. Why? Same reason earlier, right? The preservation. You don't want preserving factors. Right? So so that's where we work with the, um, yeah, the grain water is a really great idea because if you're noticing, the mushrooms are going really well in the grain. And what is the water? It's grain soup. It just has all the vitamins and stuff from that grain. That's also why you gotta be careful with how much water you're cooking your grain. So you don't wanna leach all the nutrients out of the grain either, right? So the other part of this is that like, how do you hydrate your own grain? How, have you ever cooked rice before? You know, have you cooked beans before? Yeah, so beans, if you cook it on the stove, what do you do? Yeah, you go and taste it after a while, you're like, oh, the bean isn't ready, right? I would invite you to do the same thing with any grain you're looking to cultivate, is just cook it like you would beans. Is it okay to use tap water when you're cleaning the grain? You're asking the question in the one country where everything is clean water. Okay, I li I just had li I had to I got to it was a fucking blessing to be at the lake in Guatemala where all the water or part of the effort that we were there and part of the people I was working with was to get water filters to everybody and to have clean water. I got parasites out of I mean, no, I think I healed <laughs> mushrooms. Definitely healed me because um, I'm not dealing with it anymore. But uh, here, yeah, tap water is probably good for almost everything compared to what I was working with. kilogram of grain, you might only do, you know, 300 milliliters, 400 milliliters, you know, of water in there, you know what I mean? That would, that's what that, like, percentage would mean. 
you know, but um, what you can do is also by taste test. Is that just cooking it on your on your stove until it kind of gets al dente? Like it's like if you see a couple break, then stop. That's also a good way to do it. And then what do you do after the grains in the pot? Yeah, you might pour it out on something so that it can steam out. Yeah, because you, like you're trying to control. You want the water that's in the grain to be the thing that the mycelium is, is working on. So after you do the bucket tech, you... Bucket tech is for pasteurization. The bucket tech, you bring up a good point though, that there are some people who are doing boiling water or 180 degree water into a tub or into a five gallon bucket and letting your grain sit overnight in that and hydrating it that way. You know what I mean? Because you're just you're just putting something in there that was dry, that was at room temperature, and putting it in a really, really hot environment with hot water. That starts to break down some of that, like the shells of the, you know, starts making them looser, right? It starts getting wet, and then the water starts getting absorbed because those things were dry. So you're lo looking at like things going into most to least concentration, right? That's how things flow. Most concentration, water on the outside of the grain, least concentration inside of the grain, so the water wants to go inside to equalize the environment. I think there's a movie about this, Osmosis Jones. I don't know, watch it. Disney's usually covered most of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Among other weird shit. Weird people drop those cartoons. Um, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And think about your corporate structures too. When you start building businesses, like, do you really want people working with you that haven't done psychedelics? You know what I mean? Like, think about that. Think about like your guys' level of awareness and how you're working together and what all this means. You know what I mean? And so like, uh, so yeah. So with grain, then once it's hydrated. You're gonna pour it, you're, you're, one way or the other, you're getting into a place where like if you're tasting it and it's like kind of mushy but they're not breaking, great. Pour it on a grate or steam, like in a colander, let it steam out. And then once it's done steaming, you can take a paper towel and do a paper towel test even. This is another way to see if it's like, you know, ready to go, is that you can just damp it on there. If it's just a, the minimal amount of water transfer, like even if it's just a little bit, you're like, okay, you know what I mean? Then that's usually good. And then you can put it in your bags for your jars. Why do you not want it to be still steaming when you put it in a jar or a bag? Yeah, because because now all that steam condenses, and then what does it become? Water again. Yeah, and then it coats your grains, and then it sits at the bottom, right? So now you have a pool of water in a bag, and you're gonna put it in a pressure cooker. What happens after that? Yeah, because it starts boiling those grains at the bottom of the bags or bottom of the jars, right? Yeah, so, so that's where you're trying to control the environment. You just want it to sterilize, and you know there's water inside the grains, and usually, even if you get pretty high in the hydration levels, they don't just start bursting. It would be exterior water that's gonna do that, where it's gonna boil it and then break all the shells of it. With, with that tech you're saying about some of them pouring 180 degrees of a bucket with grains? That's so just to hydrate it, and then you sterilize it. Yes, but would they still, like say, do like a light simmer? Or anything on it? I, I I found that I probably needed to for, for, for what I wanted to do. Yeah, but I, I my buddy who does it swears by it and just does that, just does that, really and just pours the water off, dries it, puts it in a bag or a jar. Right. Goes from so what you also got to realize is that like what mycelium are we working with? What are we selecting for? You know, so do do what you want to do and see if your mycelium grow on it. You know what I mean? If you want to get into what gets is, gets these results or those results, then you can join some of our calls. You can you can get into some of the community things. Because I have, yeah, there's just a ton of people out there that are really great resources. I was just alerted to this idea of Clubhouse. So I, now I'm aware of this Clubhouse thing. Um, I think it only exists with iPhones right now. But there are really cool talks. I think Discord's another, another one that people are using. Discord, I know there's like people in here even that have like Discord chats and stuff, you know, and so I guess just know that there's ways to connect further in this industry and uh, Instagram is a good place to like get to like me or like, you know, individual people and then there's other group formats. For Denver Mycology, um, we will usually do a community call every Thursday night 
that will cover like cultivation and then we'll start diving into integration and the psychedelic experience. Uh, and then Friday nights, we're starting to do integration nights at my house where you can uh, get introduced to Ape or Sananga and see what it is to maybe go, like understand a little bit more about what a ceremony could look like before you even get to share your experience about what's going on. I mean, we have found it to be um, really powerful, actually, where I don't even, you don't even have to have mushrooms to let go of some of this shit that you're going on to. Right? They just help. What is the next? So what does life look like for this tub? What does life look like for the tub? What do you guys think? Would you have to have a light on it for some period of time? Would you dark? Yeah, I mean, you know what? I actually know a lot of people who just cultivate uh, in incubation and fooding full light 24 hours. No problem. So incubation, even when you inoculate and then have them stay in the or do you need a dark or anything? I've noticed light usually has the least effect on all of this, of like all the factors going on. We've, we've played around with the light just a little bit, and it has like, even for like directional, like it's still pretty minimal in use. Be like, oh yeah. Yeah, kind of it's a uh, blue light. I found that they like blue light. Like, really? Yeah, some of the, I've used like blue LEDs and stuff, and it's been like kind of, LA. I don't know. I just felt like, it, yeah. um, dude, I like initiated pinning by accident because of that. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. So you, there are some wavelengths I found that seem to could really induce pinning um, when you don't maybe want to. Uh, I've ran a UVC light in my room before. Um, that can kill a lot of things, but then also produces these like really high frequency UVs, and that definitely fucked with some shit, and like everything started pinning like right away. <laughs> uh, UVC, we didn't cover like um, how to keep your environment uh, clean. Um, UVC is another way. Uh, it's a certain wavelength of UV that creates ozone when it's emitted. No. O3, it's a battery. It's super dangerous, actually. Ozone is like, what? Poisonous. what? Poisonous. Extremely poisonous. Uh, I thought my lungs were fucked, completely fucked one time. I was in a room after I'd run my UVC light for an hour, and, um, and I came in 30 minutes later, thinking, oh, I'm just gonna get through some tubs, I just had a lot on my mind, and I started getting tubs, and all of a sudden I was like, I was like, I'm about to have somebody drag me out of this room in a second. I was like, okay, Chris, like, <laughs> I need to like settle into this, and I like literally had to like slowly get out of the room before I stopped breathing because it was constricting my lungs. Because the the O3, the ozone gets into, and it starts. It's a radical. It just starts attacking everything. Because it's not attacking actually. It's a it's a covalent. Um, I only covalent. It's a it's a chemical reaction. It's a you know it's an electrical electrostatic reaction that's causing it to react with anything else that has um, some available electrons. <laughs> so it catalyzes reactions. Yeah, so if you run one of those lights in the room, it smells like rain. Don't go in there. Yeah. Let it air out first. Let it air out. Those ones smells like rain. Yeah. So the the smell of a sterile uh, like a hospital. Mm -hmm. Right. Or like you, what, yeah. before it lightnings. Yeah. Before that. Yeah. yeah it's that. Yeah, it's like everything's really, it's like really clean. Mm -hmm. like, you know, so uh, it is a really good tool, but it's kind of like antibiotics too. It's like, you know, you can't use it all the time. Actually, this leads us into genetic breeding a little bit. You, know, you didn't know how. Um, oh, sorry, I want to cover what you asked in the first place. This is what happens to you, it's sprawling. What's the life cycle of this tub? Well, the tub is going to colonize over the next one to three weeks, you know what I mean? I've had a tub full of colonies in a week. But that's not usually what's, you're gonna have it probably colonized within the first 14 to 21 days, full of colonies. It's usually like 14 days and then 17 days is sort of consolidation, you kind of give it a day or two and before moving into fruiting conditions. I usually move things into fruiting conditions when there's pins. Like there's already like primordia and there's like pins and that's already going and then I'll move into fruiting conditions and slowly start opening the tins and stuff, you know? When you talk about fruiting conditions, there need to be a certain temperature, that, like, because I've got stuff that's incubating and it's at a certain temperature. When you're fruiting, does that need to be a certain temperature? Does it need to be incubated as well? 
Yeah, so incubation and breeding temperatures can be the same, though some people will do incubation temperatures between 75 and 80, um, and, then, and then breeding conditions between 70 and 75. You know, so, so that's easily manageable. Incubation temp temperature, let alone environment, is like low, no airflow. Like you don't really need any airflow. Whatever is natural airflow in the area is probably fine. Um, it's not about airflow because you're allowing for the CO2 to build up and for the mycelium to just produce its like really strong network. And then when you move into brooding conditions, you're talking about hopefully constant airflow in the area. Low, like a small amount of you know, constant airflow that's going to decrease the amount of contamination you'll have across the board. You know, a really quick and dirty way to do some of this stuff, I know some people who will set up like tents for you and stuff where they'll just take a bunch of polyfill from like a like, pillow filling and some carbon filters, stuff it in the top hole of your tent or something, and then put a blower fan. That's like just pushing air into, making positive pressure into your tent. Why would you want to do positive pressure in a growing environment versus a negative pressure? Positive pressure meaning you're pushing air in and creating a pressure out versus sucking air out of the tent. Because if you're sucking air out of the tent, you're going to bring the contaminants versus if it's positive, then you're putting clean air into there and pushing out the air. Yeah, you're pushing dirty air through a filter to clean it and then um, and then that's clean air that's entering the tent and it's pushing it all out the, the seams or wherever it could be, you know like if you're doing this in a closet or whatever I used to just like have one of those like little greenhouse things you can get at Home Depot or you can get shelving and just have plastic put some plastic on the front of it or whatever you know they just think about like you can contain the environment a little bit and then I would just have a fan focus blowing out of my out of like out of the out of the environment because in that case i just want to create a draft it's different than the conversation we just had if i'm trying to control the environment then um then yeah pushing clean air into the environment which is pushing it all out the seams versus pulling air like even if the air the tent is like sealed and you say oh i'm gonna pull it through a filter no because it's probably going to be pulling air into the seams and stuff too because it's not a sealed tent so, and is that pretty important to have that airflow? Well, you have to manage airflow and humidity. Because if you're pushing air in that's drier than the air that's in there, then it's going to wick away moisture and it's going to keep pushing all the humidity that's in there. Because you may have like a humidifier that's like keeping relative humidity between like 40 and 60%, um, which is one way to do this. But caveat, this tub, as it is, the way it is, will probably get you through an entire first flush without doing anything to it. My business partners were like the worst cultivators at the beginning um, because they just were like, actually the worst and best, like they just showed that you can just put what I give you together in the tub, do absolutely nothing with it, come back and look at it two weeks later and there's a whole bunch of mushrooms in there. You know what I mean? And then there's spores everywhere. I'm like, Chris, is this, uh, is this all right? Um, and I'm like, yes, absolutely. All the exceptionalism around spores, all that. Those are really fascinating conversation yesterday. But at the end of the day, for home cultivators, um, it doesn't. The spores, all it's all good. If you grew a mushroom, it's you, success, complete success. The rest of the stuff is that like some people don't like seeing the spores all over the caps of the mushrooms. It's just aesthetic, mostly. Mostly aesthetic, but we're getting into the some of the scientific correlation around like, well, if you. If you allow the mushroom to conserve some of its energy from making spores, then does that mean that it was able to keep more of that energy into what it created in the alkaloids already, right? So it's about energy conservation and understanding a little bit more about like the actual biological dynamics of the mushroom and trying to see what works better. And usually this is going to be from a potency standpoint, unfortunately. This is a cannabis holdover. This is a human holdover. This is just the way our egos work of like, well, what if more is better? What if more happiness is better? What if more love is better? You know, that's a question I'm always asking ourselves. Do you prefer albino strains at all because they seem to not drop black spores? I prefer mushrooms. <laughs> I don't get into this game. You're not gonna see me get into this game. You know, you just aren't because it's like all the mushrooms are going potent. They just are. I don't know why. Not you know strain, what I mean? Not strain specific, just yeah, they're all really potent. You know what I mean? So that's why, like, give me some mushroom powder, and like my buddy knows what to do with it. You know? So it's like for me, 
it's a little bit different, but there is a lot of really interesting things. I'd love to see some tests. I'd love to see some not only genomic se sequencing associated with the, the, the mushrooms that are being tested, but then also potency testing across a whole bunch of different cultivators and have them all start from the same culture. Do you understand why this is like a moving target all the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like the anecdotes are the industry. Science in this industry is anecdotal. None of it, almost none of it, almost none of it is actually refined to a point where you would say that's actually true. It's a, a, anecdotal means it, it's an example of a possible truth that's in a certain context. Great, but that that's the good. Do it. You you grew a mushroom. That's what I'm saying. Don't worry about it because like, yeah, but yeah. Other than that, um, where are we at? So yeah, so you would two or three weeks for this to fully colonize, and then you're gonna move into fruiting conditions once there's like some primordia or pins that are forming, um, and then you're gonna slowly introduce uh, fresh air to it. Do you not just take this off? You like take them off a little bit of time or kind of like yeah, I'll, like I'll slide them up. I'll slide them up, you know, it's like... So it's like half air, like, kind of? Yeah. Okay. Right? So that's why it's designed that way. And then, so, so, and you can kind of adjust it and, like, play around with it. And the reason why even holes are at different levels and stuff is that there's this idea that it can help create a draft. It can create a more dynamic network of how the air is coming in. So you're sort of influencing how the air is going to interact inside that tub. People do it without the holes and stuff too. I want to empower you too that if you go home and just want to do an unmodified tub, it just, it, that's completely fine. You'll probably at least get through your first flush. Um, and then after that, it might just take a little bit more um, finagling as far as like checking on it during the day and stuff, you know, introducing air yourself or cracking the tub lid and like allowing for air to naturally percolate while also providing like some sort of draft in the area that they're growing in. This tub is just made a certain way so that it provides a service to the industry. If that's what you want, but it's not the only way to grow mushrooms. Yeah, this is, so you know what I mean? Like I'm probably the best and worst salesman for my own products, right? Like at the end of the day, I'm never, I'm never gonna tell you something that's untrue. I can I just tell you what, what is for me, and, and for this is one way to do it. And I'm sure there'll be some innovations on it too. I actually have some ideas for some other cool types of tubs. Um, as well as biodegradable bags that you can fruit in and then just toss in your compost pile after you. And just do it all in just one bag, man. You know what I mean? So that's the direction I'm moving in. I want, I want autoclavable, biodegradable bags for you to just grow in and then use as compost. Yeah, you know what I mean? This is what we want. Either that or a silicone bag that's reusable. Yeah, silicone's good. We're, we're also innovating on this. We're using silicone on top of these jars. Something we didn't talk about is that these jars have patches in them. You know? And so this is, not only is there headroom, headroom meaning like headroom, you know, like area that isn't covered uh, with water or filled with water. This is to help there be oxygen in here so that when you're aerating the mycelium and stuff that it's always has access to oxygen. And then on top of that, you might have a point 2.5, usually you want this to be more the biological grade, like a 0 0.2, 0 0.3 micron patch. Um, I think they say two or three micron. I, you know, I get confused sometimes about how their no, no, notation is, but you want it to be something that's going to keep biological organisms out, especially for a liquid culture like this, because anything that falls in here will want to grow, because it's just sugar, you know? Um, so other than that, um, I mean, you guys have been doing really good about asking questions as we go, but I do want to kind of open this up so that we can just integrate in some of this. Uh, any questions, if you need to go to the restroom, you know, do that. But we're, I'm still here, basically. Do you ever reintroduce moisture during the fruiting? Or will you just manipulate the air exchange? If, like, I've heard of people spraying. Or you don't do that, but, like, I don't know. Just because I was worried that that wasn't the way to go. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's going to be something where you're, like, you're noticing how much moisture is staying in there. Like, you'll get to a point where you can put your hand in it and kind of tell, like, okay, it's, like, not that humid. You know, you can kind of put your hand in like, you know, yeah, I'm going to spritz it. I want to get some more humidity to do it. And does that water have to be anything like distilled or boiled or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you're just heading towards, am I trying to introduce more or less contaminants? 
I, I just want to give you know what I mean. So use whatever water you have available, but there is some like ideas around that of just like I'm I'm just trying not to spray a lot of like added contaminated water or something. However, with that being said, I used to also like hydrate my tubs for a while with rainwater. Nice. Right? It, did, it did fine. Because the mycelium is still really healthy, right? So even though I may be adding in there something that is like contaminant prone, the mycelium was so strong that, that other things didn't grow still. You know what I mean? Because like once this gets once this gets completely myceliated, then that's like a that's like a an empire. Right? Like this like dude, it's it's a formidable thing. If you let it dry out or let it get too wet, then that's where you start allowing for one, if you let it dry out, it starts weakening the mycelium, which is like encouraging there to be a place for something else to grow. Um, if it gets too wet, then you're probably getting puddles of water and all that type of stuff, and then bacteria can grow in those. You know what I mean? So that's why managing it and making sure that it's like something that is really conducive for mycelium to grow is, is your idea. Which is no pools and no crackers. So if you have a pool, do you have a method to get those pools out? Do you just like roll up a paper towel and like dab it in until it's Sometimes, over? yeah. And is that like almost any time you see a pool, pretty much get it out of there? No, I mean, usually it'll kind of take care of itself if I'm right. increasing airflow, right. you know, so I won't really touch it if I'm not like, okay, I just need to like adjust the vents a little bit more and I'm going to allow the airflow to take care of it. If for some reason that's not taking care of it and like I really, there's a big pool, then yeah, I'll probably get a paper towel and, and do that. But you have a lot more freedom. Once it's like fully colonized, it's, it's pretty resilient. Airflow is what's going to be important then, so that you're not allowing a bunch of stuff to settle in the places that it might get weak. I just uh, added a lot more airflow this morning. I'm like halfway through the room. Um, and someone like had suggested yesterday that like they get it and like they found a, a large like increase like the next day. So if I don't see any, I'll like add the extra layer because we do like two layers of transport tape. So I just did one on to see how they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, this is my first go around, so it's like I saw I'm asking this kind of question. It's just it's like we're about ready to like this was like our experimental. Bro, moment. that's why I'm here. Yeah. You know, I took a whole day out to do this. This is usually a class that is paid for, you know what I mean? Like, no, like I'm, I'm learning better and better how to like do that for myself, even like value my time so that, so that I can keep doing this work, you know? Yeah. It's important work. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think, honestly, I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> um, Amazing. So I think we can kind of get to the place of like closing the space and and really like it's not closed closed because I want this to be open for other reasons, but um, just so you feel like you don't have to be captivated anymore, captured, captives. <laughs> um, and I just want to thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for being here. This is like super epic, and uh, it's so cool to be able to bring a flow hood and. A bunch of equal legal shit down in September and do this. Thank you. Will you help me post this so yeah. I don't fuck it up? Ah, perfect. <laughs> I don't want to touch anything. <laughs>